You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. I don't give a damn about my reputation. Living in the past is a new generation. A girl can do what she wants to do, and that's what I'm gonna do. I don't give a damn about my reputation. You know what I don't give a damn about? Our singing ability! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? How's it going? You are li- listening slash watching the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Yeah. You know what? This is the last one. This is the last set review. The I mean, marathon. Not ever, not ever. <laughs> but for now, we've been doing, it feels like we've been doing set reviews for about six weeks now, so, yeah. which is true. Ma- I don't think we've had as many two-hour videos ever released on the channel in a single month until this one. But we're here, Ikoria, the set review of the non-legendary cards. It's the last of the sets from Commander 2020 all the way through Ikoria, all in the same month, all in the same set drop. And finally, we're going to finish it off. And if you can't tell, we're ready for a little bit of a break. Yeah, it's been a busy month, but we got to get through this because there are a ton of cards. If you're watching the video in front of us, there's a lot to talk about. The main set brings actually quite a bit to the table for Commander. Yeah, very exciting. So before we get into it, we're going to break down all these cards, talk about the ones we think are going to make a splash in the format. If you want to get a hold of any of this stuff, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You hear us talk about it each and every episode because they are the best place to pre-order right now. All Mm -hmm. of your cards, they're going to get you your stuff the fastest. It's going to be in the best condition, whether you're getting sealed product or you're just buying the singles that you need for your deck. Either way, when you get that stuff, you know you're going to buy it anyway. You really are supporting our channel, our content, game nights, this podcast, everything we do. Yeah, really exciting stuff. And obviously, Ultra Pro, a huge contributor to this show as well, and the sponsor we've had for quite a long time. When it comes to getting those cards and protecting them, there's one brand that we trust above all, and that's Ultra Pro. It has been that way for the past five years on the show. We've been sleeving up our cards with their products since the very, very beginning. You can see it in the game nights intros. You can see it any time we're playing or taking pictures of our board states. So again, supporting Ultra Pro also supports the show. The show. So thank you all for that. And the final way to support all of our all of our content is directly if you get a patreon.com slash command zone. You can interact with Jimmy and I daily mm-hmm. on our Discord server. You get to do things like see game nights before anybody else. All kinds of perks for everybody that supports us. And one of the perks is we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. Woohoo. And this episode is dedicated to Jordan, Jordan Kiffmeyer. Jordan, you rock. Yeah. We wrote it as Jodren. But I'm pretty like, sure that's a typo. It's I'm pretty just sure Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. It was Jodoran's kind of like Joda. He's like a magic <laughs> card then, yeah. Um, all right. Let's just jump into it. The set review for Akoria Layer of Behemoths, not to be confused with the set review for Commander 20, which we just recently did. <laughs> we already did a video about all the legendary creatures from this set. So this is going to be just the cards that are in the 99. If you're interested in what we think of all the things that can be your commander, mm-hmm. go check out that video. We also did a video about all of the mechanics in the set, and that's a 50-minute extravaganza bonanza of just how complicated the cards are. And of course... There's even more that we didn't cover now that I'm looking at the comments and all that. But if you want to find out about the crazy mechanics like mutate, ability counters, and companion, we break all of that down as well. When we started to do that video, I was like, this will be 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's still an hour because the, co- yeah. the mechanics are very complicated. So, yeah, definitely check that out. There is one new, or not new, but returning mechanic uh, in this set that we didn't cover in the new mechanics video because it's not new. It's very simple. It's cycling. Yep. This is just an effect on a card. It's an activated ability on a card, actually which allows you to pay a certain amount and then you can discard that card and draw a card. So it allows you to just sort of not cast it or use it as the rest of its text. Now, there are also cycling cards that have some sort of trigger when you cycle this, do this. Mm -hmm. So you also get like an effect sometimes. Yeah. Cycling, very good value in general. It's great for those decks that want to draw more than one card a turn. And there's a lot of that running around the commander these days. Anything that has cycling is a little bit better than it looks Mm -hmm. because the ability for you to have it in your hand and be like, I don't actually want this effect right now. Let me just cash in for another card is very flexible. Yeah. Um, The lower the cycling cost, the better it is generally for commander. But cycling does make cards just better in general for you, especially narrow cards. And there's a couple of cards that Wizards has printed now that literally are just straight up better than the version of it without cycling. Right, because you may as well. Let's imagine two cards did the exact same thing, but one had cycling too. The cycling one's just better. Way better, actually. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, because they do the same thing, plus the other one has this other mode, which is like, recycle this card. Yeah. 
All right, let's start, as we always do, with the new Planeswalkers from the set. There are three. Yeah, very And this exciting. one's actually a new Planeswalker. Like, we've never seen this character before. Yeah, it's the, the Cat King. It's Luca Coppercoat Outcast, a mono Sleeps red with the fishes. Sleeps with the fishes. Sleeps sorry. with the fishes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> three red red for a five loyalty Planeswalker, Luca. His plus one, exile the top three cards of your library. Creature cards exiled this way gain. You may cast this card from exile as long as you control a Luca Planeswalker. The minus two, exile target creature you control, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card with higher converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And the minus seven, each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. Probably not going to get to that minus seven quite often, but this is really exciting for mono red players. The plus one is card draw. Um, right, it's that impulsive draw uh, with a little twist, right? Yeah, you get to do it as long as you have the Planeswalker. Now, it doesn't protect the Planeswalker, and it's a five-mana Planeswalker, which means when you play it, probably not going to be able to do something else to the board to add to it. So it's a little dangerous there, but it's still something that gives you access to up to three cards. And the negative two does kind of or could protect the Planeswalker, right? You mm -hmm. you play Luka, negative two, get rid of one of your creatures, cash in for a, a bigger creature, quote-unquote a more expensive creature, right? Yeah. And especially if you like attacked with that creature, you know, get rid of it, get a new one. The new one comes into play. It's untapped. It could be a blocker. Yeah. So that could kind of be the protection for Luca. Also, you know, you can build your deck in ways that like make sure that, you know, you're always getting a good hit. Yeah. M once you cross a th certain threshold, maybe there's no creatures in the middle. They're just all huge or small. You know, you can do stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, one card that I think has finally gotten its time to shine is seven dwarves because <laughs> you put seven of these two drops in your deck because you can have up to seven cards named seven dwarves and boom, all of a sudden when you use Luca, you're guaranteed to get something above two CMC if that's like the lowest you're, you're at. Right. If you only have two drops and then nine drops or whatever <laughs> don't do that yeah <laughs> don't build around just luca but uh, you know in theory if you did something like that yeah. i also think decks that just have a lot of big stuff mm -hmm. it's generally going to be good right because hey if you're just going to put a seven drop out there and you're going to cash in for the next big thing which is going to be eight or bigger you know there's not that many yeah i think any gruel based creature deck if you have like a dragon deck things that with a lot of like one mana birds of paradises and stuff you can cash those in for something much bigger down the line which is kind of cool um also just mana dorks right like yeah. early in the game mana dorks help you power stuff out but once you've got like 11 or 12 mana that birds of paradise you'd probably rather it was something really big and they usually turn into blockers at that point yeah <laughs> so just being able to like hey roll the dice maybe i get you know mm -hmm. something huge i mean you can get luca out turn three right with enough mana ramp on one awesome. two and then boom you can create something potentially huge so i think for brawl this is really interesting obviously yeah true because it can be your commander in brawl yeah uh and then gashoth is another just good good choice here because that deck is just basically all five drops and up dinosaurs for the most part and then small mana dorks mm -hmm. so all right very cool i i, I, don't, cool. I don't think luca's gonna go in a lot of decks but it does have no. some usage Red base creature decks, mono red decks. I think Luca has potential if you have a lot of creatures in there. I could see this also being good in the Goblin deck. All right, the next one is Narset of the Ancient Way. Narset is practicing her high kicks. Dude, she's about to kick a mana symbol off. Somebody, <laughs> somebody said if she could kick a little bit higher, she would only cost three, three mana. mana. <laughs> <laughs> because she costs one, a blue, a red, and a white, so four mana for a four loyalty planeswalker. Her plus one is you gain two life and then add blue, red, or white. Spend this mana only to cast a non-creature spell. So she's a kind of a weird mana rock. Very Jeskai, though. Yeah. And then her negative two is draw a card, and then you may discard a card. When you discard a non-land card this way, Narset of the Ancient Way deals damage equal to that card's converted mana cost to target creature or planeswalker. Very interesting. You may discard a card. So yeah. you can just draw a card and just, that's it. I drew a card. That's kind of cool. Yeah, and it's only if you want to discard a card to deal damage to a creature or a planeswalker. And also, you do not have to discard the card you drew. Yeah. And then her negative six, her ultimate is, you get an emblem with, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this emblem deals two damage to any target. Not majorly impactful, but in the decks that just are storm decks or just spells matters decks, that could very quickly spiral out of control. But it's, I'd say you're playing this card for the other two abilities first. Yeah, for the... Um, for the mana ramp of it, she is mana ramp because every turn you can plus her, gain two life, and then add one mana to cast a non-creature spell. Yeah. It's nice that it's non-creature. It's not instant and sorcery. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do mana rocks and all that. And then she does have card draw on there. She per does not protect herself at all, really. I guess technically you can do the negative two and then kill something, but in mm -hmm. Commander, that's, you know, if there's one two or thing. three creatures yeah. that can attack you, that's not as good. Um, 
Yeah, there's some value there. I, I don't know. She she doesn't... The fact that it ramps in Jeskai colors is probably the most notable thing. Um, it is, of course, conditional. You can only do that. It reminds me a little bit of Sarkin Unbroken, which is like the teamer version of Narset in the Lava Ways. Yeah, but, but he drew a card and he added one of any color. <laughs> yeah, and Sarkin has green, so you're obviously going to have access to ramp anyway. So I do like Narset for that matter. Um, I'm just always scared of Planeswalkers like this because the most common play pattern that it feels like anyway is going to mm-hmm. be play it plus it get that effect, and then it'll get attacked and maybe killed or maybe get to plus it one more time. And yeah, then, it just gets wrecked. Yeah, would you want to play a rock that only gave you mana twice and then blew up? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the problem, too, is that because it is Jeskai, it's hard to put it into decks like Real the Everwise, which would be a really good fit for this, but you have that extra color. Yep. So instead, you're like, maybe this goes into a Shu Yun deck and you just want to really kick people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's interesting if you play Flux Channeler. It's a card that when you cast on creature spells, you proliferate. And oh, if you can yeah. do that, plus a spell like Quicken or any of those sort of like one mana cantrips, you can get Narset to ultimate that same turn that you play her. Because it goes plus one, and then you you know you flush Channel flux up, up to six, and then hey, you know maybe next turn you get to and once proliferate. You, got the emblem, and, you don't care if she dies. Yeah, like you've got the emblem, and now you're just going to cast a lot of spells and try and you know, I mean you could throw that damage anywhere. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Um, maybe this is good for a Super Friends deck because you're casting other Super Friends with non-creature spells and it can ultimate all the way when it comes out. I don't know. It's not overwhelming, but it's not underwhelming. It's kind of just... My guess is this will be like a lot of Planeswalkers. We just don't see it very much. Luka will be similar. There'll be certain decks that maybe once in a while yeah. you see it and you'll be like, what's that do again? You but know, in two to three years, <laughs> it'll be like Sark and Unbroken where you're like, hold on, I got to read hold it on, quick. Yeah, Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this guy loves dragons, right? Yeah. Yeah, same story. All right, you want to read the yeah. last Planeswalker from the set? This one, I think, is the most exciting by yeah. far. It's Vivian, Monster's Advocate, the one that you saw in the trailer. Yeah, she, she don't give a damn about her reputation. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, yeah, she's she's quite brave. Three green green for a three loyalty Planeswalker. That's interesting. Uh, however, it's got two static abilities on it, like the other Planeswalkers from the Dominant. War of the Spark. War of the Spark, right. Uh, you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you may cast creature spells from the top of your library. So she's card draw. Yeah. <laughs> Just that, right there. That that, by the way, makes it already better, better than the other two. <laughs> yeah. Like already. Except for maybe Luca's minus two, but that's in conditional too, right? This is just stamped on the card. All right, her plus one. Create a 3-3 green beast creature token. Put your choice of a vigilance counter, a reach counter, or a trample counter on it. So it protects itself right there. That's really good. Yeah. And then minus two, when you cast your next creature spell this turn, search your library for a creature card with lesser converted mana cost, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So you're not getting rid of anything. You're just getting an extra creature when you do this. And you're tutoring it. Yeah. It's not like your random library. off the top of your deck either. <laughs> yeah, this this card's very, very strong. We're going to see this card a lot more because you play it, you plus it, make a 3-3 three, three with reach. Mm-hmm. And now if they want to keep you off that negative two, which they want to keep you off of because we're going to talk in a second here about the fact that like that could be an instant win. Instant, yeah. Is... They've got to have two creatures that can get through mm-hmm. your 3 3 with reach. They got to have one, you jump block, you don't care. And she's going to be at four, so they got to be able to hit it for at least three. This is turn five, too. You better have other creatures out if you're playing green. Yeah, this is very a very scary card. And, and it's also just a good card with just the static abilities, too. So mm-hmm. you get the plus, you don't care if you're chump blocking, because if you just happen to, like, even if you don't have any sort of combo stuff to do, you just, like, rip a creature off the top of your library and cast it, you just replace the card. Yeah. yeah. This, car- this card seems very, very good to me. Let's talk about what you can do with the negative two, which the- is the more interesting... Templating is weird here because it says when you cast your next creature spell. Yeah. It doesn't say when the next creature spell you control enters the battlefield because then... So the like, smaller oh, one's going to come in first, right? Yeah, So which is kind of crazy because then you can cast an Avenger of Zendikar and before that enters the battlefield, you can grab a Perforos out of your library, put it on the battlefield, and then the Avenger of Zendikar comes in and then boom, you get Makes all the tokens. a million plants and kills everyone. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. That's really crazy. <laughs> I think they did that way so you couldn't flicker the creatures that you minus two in target or something, but instead by making it cast, it almost it makes, also it makes it more better. powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can do, so there's a whole bunch of combos, right? Any two card combo that you can come up with where one of them costs more than the <laughs> other, right? Pretty, pretty common. So some them. are out though, like Micaeus Triskelion, they're both six. Mm-hmm. So you can't do Mike and Trike, but like Kitchen Finks and Malira. Right. And this is the easiest one to pull off because they're a three drop and a two drop. So if you have Kitchen Finks, which is a creature that when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life, but it has persist. This is mm-hmm. a classic combo with Malira who is a creature that says um, creatures you control can't have negative one, negative one counters placed on them. It's got other text too, but that's what matters for the combo. And so if you have a sack outlet, you kitchen sphinx, 
or kitchen Sphinx, not Sphinx. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that's a new card. Yeah. Kitchen Sphinx. Oh man. Oh, that's Mara. an uncard. Hit us up. <laughs> uh, and then, so you you sack the kitchen Sphinx, and then it comes back with persist, but it can't get the negative one counter. Yeah. So then you just sack it over and over, and that's an infinite, infinite life. life. Game. Yeah. Yeah. And Malarious is very good. You I, can do that. Uh, Murderous Red Cap can just do damage and kill everybody. Same combo. Um, Palancron just with anything. I mean, like Palancron's a card that just is nuts already. But it, that's Dead all. Eye Navigator is yeah. I think what you get right because that untaps your lands mm-hmm. and then. And then you um, use the lance to flicker the Palancron. That's infinite mana. Yeah. You have Kiki Jiki's combos are all oh, literally right. here in any teamer deck because Kiki Jiki's five mana and the other cards are Pester my, Pester my, my XR. Yeah. So, like, it's like uh, easy. Woodfall Primus is another one where if oh, you get Lord. Malira with it, if you just have a lot of mana, then you just blow up everybody's all their lands. Yeah. People have said Slivers decks would do really well with this because there's just so many value Slivers to find the one that you need at that exact moment is pretty good too. Felidar Guardian, a card that's just combo tastic. Um, well, you get a flicker Vivian and do it all over again. Yep. So it's. Not to mention, by the way, we didn't even think about it, but the minus two shuffles the top of your deck. Yep. So you could see a new creature spell on the top of it if you don't, for instance, have one on there. So it's kind of got that fetch land ability to it, too, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. There's just uh, the negative two on Vivian. It's going to be a thing where if people cast this and they make the reach defender, mm-hmm. 3 3. It's going to be the whole table has to be like, we have to kill that because, you know, unless you know for certain the person on their deck, good chance we die yeah. when they untap. You know? Well, if you have eight mana, then you can do Vivian plus Kitchen Finks. Yeah. And then if you have a National's Altar out, you have infinite life and infinite mana. Like, it's just that easy. And Anytime you're tutoring creatures onto the battlefield, Birthing Pod, Vanifar style, yeah. right? We've just learned uh, Yisan. That's just an extraordinarily powerful thing to be doing and has the potential to instantly end the game the first time that that is used. So, yeah. Um, Fibble Thib is cute because you get more cards, but you're probably not going to want to do that because Galta, you I like <laughs> Galta's, right? Yeah, Galta's nuts <laughs> because Galta is technically a 12 drop, but it cast it costs one less to cast for uh, or sorry it costs x less to cast where x is the total power of creatures you control so if you've got like you know six power and creatures out this is six mana but you can go find something that costs you can go find ulamog or something yeah you know? which don't do because it's well, a cast trigger but you get what i'm saying well i mean just ulamog out there it's still ulamog yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i like still vivian a lot this card it seems very powerful um clearly it's the best planeswalker of the three but i'm still pretty happy with where they put luca at um just because it's mono red and anything that re- even resembles card draw gets me excited. So. One thing about Vivian is it uh, doesn't matter with doubling season that much. I, I guess it still matters in that you will still want to stop that negative two, but it's not yeah. like there's an ultimate on there. So. Yeah, yeah. But you do get to get two green 3-3 three, three beasts and one can have Vigilance and one can have, uh, you know, Trample on it. Yeah, it does seem like one of the better Planeswalkers we've seen in recent years for sure. Yeah, coming in at three, not a big deal because it also has an enchantment stacked onto it. Cool. Love it. All right, let's talk about... There, they went cycle nuts in this set. Yes. So there are a lot of cycles. We're going to run through about four of them here and then one more near the end. <laughs> this first one is the one people I think are probably the most excited about. It's the ultimatum cycle. It's the enemy... Enemy colored? It's the wedge colored. It's the wedge colored, ulti- yeah. Ultimatum. The cons of Tarkir ultimatums, I guess, is what I'm calling them. Okay. And there's uh, there's five of them, obviously, because there's five wedges. And, well, let's just read them. Well, the first one's pretty nuts. This first one may be one of the single most powerful cards outside of, like, Omniscience, right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's very powerful. Obviously, they're all very hard to cast, mm-hmm. very mana intensive, but they have huge effects. Yeah. So, Eerie Ultimatum. Very spooky. White, white, black, 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 green, green. That's seven mana total for a sorcery. Return any number of permanent cards with different names from your gravi- graveyard to the battlefield. So I'm going to choose all of them. Just yeah, FYI. Why, why not? You know, <laughs> unless there's one in there that is some weird non-bow. You're not getting other copies of basic lands, but this is commander, right? This is why Lutri wasn't allowed into the companion uh, list for us as yeah, a format. Yeah, the drawback is not a drawback different names we don't okay fine that's that's most of my deck then yeah you may as well just say return all permanents except for basic one and one of each basic land type yeah <laughs> or basic land sorry not land type even yeah this is gonna be crazy when it goes off because people are gonna have 40 50 cards in there yeah uh, it's primeval's glorious rebirth without any of the stipulations right like primeval's glorious rebirth is return all legendary permanent cards but this doesn't care about legendary nor do you need to have a legendary creature or planeswalker to cast it you just cast this for seven and get everything back it's true and primeval's is also seven mana although not as color intensive but still but still yeah um a card that you put on the list that i like is called morality shift (laughs) 
It's five black black, but it says exchange your graveyard and library, then shuffle your library. So let's say your graveyard has like seven cards in it, <laughs> and your library has like 80. You just go, oh, I'm going to switch those. So my library now has seven. You may as well just take the library and just turn it right <laughs> on the battlefield. And then if you cast that next, yeah, you're probably going to win because you're going to put like 80 things out. It's hard to imagine not winning from that position. Like even if you like, let's say you did use Hermit Druid and you had a disastrous Hermit Druid flip, then you cast Morality, Morality Shift. Shift. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, Her you Hermit just... Druid, very good with this, obviously, especially since in a deck with your ultimatum you don't want as many basic lands maybe you only have like two or three of each or less yeah, yeah i mean we've, we've obviously seen her major decks that have like one basic land in the whole thing so they don't mill themselves you can do that horizon canopy and these types of lands they did another reprint cycle of them in modern horizons not reprint new ones of all the other colors that are missing it so these are great because you get lands in the graveyard you get extra value out of them obviously fetch lands fetch strip lines, mine yeah. It's Already actually, cards these decks are playing too yeah i think concordant crossroads is really good with eerie ultimatum because there is a way you resolve this spell and don't win the game, and that's that you everything you've got to do has to wait till your next untap, right? right? It's a bunch of creatures and stuff. And so if you just have Concordant Crossroads in your deck that can be milled away and brought back with your ultimatum, or Chroma's Memorial is another one, yeah. they they can then give haste to all your stuff, and if it's creatures, it can attack right now. I mean, obviously, creatures is not the only way this is going to go. Just a lot of... It, Enchantments and artifacts could win you the game in other ways, or aristocracy stuff. Mm -hmm. Or you can do the Malera Kitchen Finks thing and just gain infinite life, too. You know, there's a lot of ways to go here. Obviously, Obzon is, you know, Teamer's all been about wheel type effects recently. Yeah. Every Obzon card has just been like, please fill your graveyard yeah. up. Graveyard. Do graveyard, everything graveyard. graveyard, yeah. So that's yeah. pretty interesting. Play graveyard hate, people. Yeah, <laughs> you really do now, especially after this. Just this, seems like uh, more and more and more. Yeah, you really need it badly. I mean, Eerie Ultimatum. Like, sure, you can see an, an omniscience coming from a while, but seven mana is typically not when I'm expecting people to win the game. Right. Well, Mine, it's like not. mine's dilation-ish. Like, it's going to be powerful, yeah. but, like, you have a chance against it. This is like, yeah, if it resolves, if they've, but they need some setup, right? Yeah. It can't just be run, rush to seven mana and then cast it. They have to have milled themselves and done some yeah, stuff. Yeah, they so, just tap Hermit Druid once. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, that's yeah. a good point. It's a good point. So there are a lot of ways to, to, to do it. Interesting card. Very powerful. We'll probably be seeing a lot of that in every Abzan deck. Uh, the next one, pretty powerful as well. It's Emergent Ultimatum. This is the one starring Shailene Wood Woodley, I suppose. Black, black, <laughs> green, green, blue, blue, it's seven mana. <laughs> Search your library for up to three monocolored cards with different names and exile them. Oh, sorry. It's a sorcery. An opponent chooses one of those cards. Shuffle those card, that card into your library, and you may cast the other cards without paying their mana cost, and then you exile Emergent Ultimatum. So, All right. So I tutor for three cards. I show them to Jimmy. Jimmy says, not that one. I shuffle that one back into my library. Very important. It doesn't go into exile and doesn't go into your graveyard. Mm -hmm. You shuffle it back in your library. And then the other two that Jimmy didn't pick... I can cast those without, without paying their mana cost. Ugh. And this is three monocolored cards. It's not creatures. Yeah. So it can be Sorcery, instant sorceries, planeswalker. enchantments, planeswalkers. Again, you cast them. So they're going into play that turn, two out of three. Obviously, these type of cards, every time they make them, there are some combo where it doesn't matter what your opponent chooses, you now win. Yeah. Um, because you just give them the choice of three things, and by removing any one of them, it doesn't stop you from, you know, basically winning. I like your first grouping, which is like yeah, well, three like, of the most powerful what, cards. What would happen, right? This yeah. isn't like an instant win, but it kind of is. All right, Josh, I'm going to choose Enter the Infinite, Expropriate, and omniscience which so, one do you put away yeah i mean i think you put enter the infinite away I but then you know. just Maybe have it's omniscience and, and then you, you have omniscience that, <laughs> and you hope that they just don't have enough mana to do enough because i think if omniscience and enter the infinite if they get those two they're going to win because they can yeah. cast they have their entire deck in their hands and then cast it all for free so if you have to have, put one of those two back which means you always get expropriate expropriate uh, again a card that only once in my life have I ever seen it resolve and that player didn't win. So just by itself, expropriate's very, very scary because usually wins by itself. Yeah, this could say seven mana cast expropriate, right? Yeah, exactly. And that would just be very powerful, right? By itself, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. That would be broken. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's any way in that combination that they're not like 95% chance to win, right? Yeah, like, like, there's so, I mean, there's they're all 9, 10, 11 CMC card, cost cards. And you get two of them, so yeah. you're like, hey, I don't care what you do, but I'm casting 18 mana worth of stuff off this 7 mana spell. Yeah, that's crazy, actually, to yeah. think of that rate. Yeah, that... Okay. Well, we know that those blue cards are good. The you big can do like cards. expropriate and then like a doubling season and then a planeswalker that can ultimate with it. So even if you don't get 
the doubling season, you get expropriate more turns, and you get yeah. Ulti- isn't the uh, isn't the um, Tamio the three color Tamio in in uh, Soul Tide colors? Yeah, it, unfortunately, it's not a mono colored card. Oh right, it has to be mono colored card. Yeah, yeah but right, you right. could still again like there's lots of different cards that can find cards for you. You could yeah. just search up three tutors too. <laughs> That's <laughs> like true. Like it doesn't matter. Because... You really do whatever you want here, but you're gonna want to do the ones that you cast immediately. Okay, so you have a Doomsday combo put down. Yeah, there. everyone loves Doomsday. No, just kidding. Uh, Doomsday is a black, black, black sorcery. Search your library and graveyard for five cards and exile the rest. Put the chosen cards on top of your library in any order. You lose half your life rounded up. The combo is do five cards and they're all card draw cards in like Thassa's Oracle. So then you basically Doomsday up and you have Gush or you have Knight's Whisper. But the big card here is probably Dark Petition because it allows you to get Dark Petition and Doomsday and then a card like Tainted Pact or something or a tutor that basically allows you to create the combo no matter what your Dark Petition is your, yeah, that's your yeah, tutor. That's, that's the big one, right? So that if they get rid of the Doomsday or the Gush. Well, they have to get rid of Doomsday as a thing. Right. So you just Dark Petition and then you get the Doomsday out. So right. that's like your backup. Um, another combo, and this is not going to surprise anyone, it's a Thassa's Oracle combo, is you get Thassa's Oracle, Tainted Pact, and Demonic Consultation. Right. So if they get rid of the Tainted Pact or the Demonic Consultation, the other one immediately, these are cards that immediately mill you out. Mm-hmm. And then you just win with the Thassa's Oracle. So they have to get rid of the Thassa's Oracle. The problem is the card emergent ultimatum says shuffle it into your library. Yep. Well, Tainted Pact says you remove the top card of your library from the game, game and then you may put that card into your hand unless it's the same name as another card removed from this game. Uh, remove this way. And then you repeat this process until you choose to put a card in your hand and then you remove two cards uh, into sorry into your hand or you remove two cards with the same name which you won't do um, whichever comes first because you'll just build a deck that does not have multiples of basic lands mm-hmm. so this base tainted pack says find any card in your deck but mill until you find it so you will just go until you find Thassa's Oracle yeah and then you'll cast demonic consultation which is name a card and then you review we've talked about this in combos forever uh, you reveal cards from the top of your deck until the named card is revealed. You just name a card that's not in your deck and that yeah. mills you out entirely. Then Thassa's Oracle wins with its trigger. So, so having the tutors baked onto the cards, it, it just gives your opponents an impossible choice, right? Yeah. So Emergent Ultimatum is another card, I think even more so than Eerie Ultimatum, that if it resolves and, and you build your deck and you want to do this, it, it will win, win you. you the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. It's, it's just... It's kind of tooth and nail, right? It's gonna, but it's not just for creatures. But it's gonna go fi- tutor you two things. Yeah, the fact that you can grab tutors with it, non-creature. I mean, uh, yeah, non-creature cards too. Like, you just needs to be a monocolored card. Yeah, that's crazy. All right, let's talk about the next one, which is not quite as good. Not quite as good. We're gonna get worse and worse as we go on here. Uh, Genesis Ultimatum, green, green, blue, 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 red, red. It's the teamer one. It's a sorcery that says, look at the top five cards of your library. Put any number of permanent cards from among them onto the battlefield, and the rest into your hand. Exile Genesis Ultimatum. Now, not as good. You only get the top five cards. You only just gonna go digging through your library for, for whatever, whatever you, want. you want or your entire graveyard. But still pretty good. This is built for Maelstrom Wanderer. It's less CMC than Maelstrom Wanderer. And holy Wanderer moly. gives everything that you get off of it haste. Yeah, so you're going to cast Genesis Ultimatum, get another thing off it, and then you're going to cast it again. Cause, yeah, so there's a lot that can happen, obviously, with Genesis Ultimatum and Maelstrom Wanderer. Yeah, this is just a value card. If you set it up, it could be very, very scary. Mm-hmm. Um, but you really want haste with this stuff, and in some respects, you can't get... There's... There's not a way to guarantee this wins every time you cast it in the same way as an Emergent Ultimatum, right? Right. And then there's not a way for it to just be overwhelmingly powerful like Eerie Ultimatum, where, like, there's no way... Unless you scroll rack the but combo. Even, yeah, right? even... But that takes more setup, even. Exactly. I, I guess Eerie Ultimatum takes setup. you got to mill yourself. But there's no way to get 80 things into play with right. Genesis Ultimatum. Up to five, yeah. yeah. It's, it, I think it's a strong card, but it's just definitely, like... We're going to see this one played a lot of times where we're like, oh, let's see what happens. And then you, you're like, you get too good big creatures and but, a land or two lands yeah. like oh cool that was pretty impressive but now we have not, to deal with that yeah but it's not like oh we're all dead yeah shuffle up please yeah all right the next one's probably the worst one it's the jeskai one it's blue blue red 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 white white again they're all seven mana for a sorcery target player gains five life inspired ultimatum deals five damage to any target and then you draw five cards Quack. I'd rather just do a card that can draw me five cards and is repeatable or has more <laughs> than because the five damage chain target, sure, it's a f- removal spell, but this is seven mana. That's a lot of mana. Compared to what the other ones are doing, this doesn't even seem like it's in the same same league. It's in the same ballpark. Yeah. It's just I mean, they're nowhere near. Not all designed for commander, right? Right. But they also feel like they're designed for commander. But the Jeskai one, not very inspired for what it's called. 
The five life doesn't matter at all. I don't, it's like that doesn't exist, right? Like it barely matters. Five damage to something is like a bad removal spell because it won't get rid of like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like even if it said destroy target creature and you draw five cards, still for seven mana, that's not worth it. Five card? Why don't we draw seven cards? Like, <laughs> even then, I think it wouldn't be that great. Seven, seven, seven seems pretty sweet. I, I think that's e- that's not even pushing it too hard. But in general, you're in white. If you're playing this card, you have Path to Exile. And you're in blue. You have a billion other ways to draw cards. Yeah, this just seems kind of bad, actually. I, I, this one, I doubt we'll see much at all. Yeah. This now, is a cube card. That's a cube card, for sure. Brandon Sanderson is going to put that in his cube. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have... It's not it's, Grixis, but it's close, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this last one. Actually, this one is up there in power level. I think it's probably the third best. Yeah, it's Runus Ultimatum. Mardu finally getting some love. By the way, Mardu's going to get a little bit of love in this set review, which is exciting. Red, red, white, 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 black, black for a sorcery. Destroy all non-land permanents your opponents control. All non-land permanents your opponents opponents control. Yeah, that's like... Destroy like, them all. It's like Klein Grip blow up the board, kind it's of? Like, Overload? Uh, yeah, it's like... What is it? Garrick's... Um, in Garrick's Wake. In Garrick's Wake, but yeah. But that only gets creatures and planeswalkers. This is all non-land permits, so all their enchantments and artifacts... Yeah, that's... ...are wiped away. Gone. In Mardu? Yeah. Pretty good. This is a very strong card. I think the biggest downside to this card is it has white, white, white in its casting cost. That's a lot. Which, white, as we know, it's not a joke, right? That white, white as we know, is the weakest color, which tends to play itself out, meaning that in your decks, mm-hmm. you have less white than the other colors in any deck that that has white in it. I've quite right. a few decks that have white in it, but oftentimes white is like eight cards, nine cards in the deck, which means I have less mana sources for white in those decks, which means Ruinous Ultimatum's a lot harder to cast than if it was black, black, black there or red, red, red there. Obviously, right. they templated these all the same as far as casting costs for a reason because that's kind of how, you know, it looks pretty or whatever. Mm-hmm. But... The white, 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 I think, actually, like, knocks it down, like, a half a notch as to how good it could be. Because because it's a little harder to cast. This is actually the hardest to cast, I'd say, of all of them, just the way that deck construction tends to go, where you just don't see a lot of decks that have heavy white. Yeah, and also, like, given how many non-basics we play in our decks, having exactly that at turn seven or whenever you're supposed to is gonna be tough too especially in those color combinations too there's no fixing really like yeah it's have the signets and stuff yeah um it's interesting if you guys look on the back of a magic card you'll notice that the the anytime it's a three color pip on the symbol it's the enemy color so in mardu it's red black and white and white is the one that's the enemy color of red and black and yeah. then for salti it's the green that has the three pips so that's sort of how they base these off um for this the set is that that's we're in the wedge colors but we're focusing on that color instead i believe it was different i think it was like focused on one of the allied colors and cons well i mean this is still obviously a very powerful card destroy all everything from your only your opponents and not yourself um, i just wrote vidalkan orrery right if you, <laughs> turn it into an instant <laughs> if you can make this at instant speed it gets a million times better because if you resolve that on the end step before your turn it's yeah. a game winning play rather than a thing where like oh all three players are now against you and you just tapped out to do this yeah uh so yeah i I think people are going a little overboard with how good this is, but I do think it's good. Yeah, it's third best. Emergent Ultimatum. If we had to rate them, I think we're on the same page here. Emergent Ultimatum, it wins you the game if you build your deck around it. Eerie Ultimatum, obviously, is going to create an overwhelming board state for your opponents. And then Ruinous Ultimatum is a great catch-up card, great set yourself in front, but it doesn't win you the game, so that's why Emergent takes the cake. Genesis Ultimatum is probably the, the next one because... And that one, I think, will be the sort of most fun and the one we'll, we'll see the most sort of fair usages. Because uh-huh. it's just like, ah, get some random stuff off the top of your deck. Let's see what it is. Yeah. And then Inspired Ultimatum, yeah. I don't think we're really going to see that card. No, just I don't think five, so. Just five, either. five, and five is not enough. No. Okay. Let's okay. go to the next cycle. The Mythos cycle. So if you remember in our Legendary Creatures episode, we talked about all the new like Legendary cards that have Mutate on them. And uh, they are all here now because they have a Mythos around them. They are just clearly... That legendary, that an extra story needs to be told, not to mention the artist. The artist is sweet. It's like, um, it's like cave paintings. Cave paintings. Of it's course, pretty awesome. Seb McKinnon killing yeah. it. All right. The first one up is Mythos of Brokos. And they all have an interesting amount of text on them that we'll talk about right after this. The templating on the rules is really weird. It's really, yeah. Once you understand it, it makes sense, but it's just weird. Yeah. All right. Two green green for a sorcery. And let's just read the part that doesn't, the second part. So two green green by itself, if you just pay two green green without any other colors, return up to two permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. So double regrowth kind of permanent cards. Yeah, so. permanents. Now, 
all of these Mythos cards have this extra text on here based on the wedge. So in this case, this is the Sultai one for Brokos. If blue and black was spent to cast this spell, search your library for a card, put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle your library, and then you're going to resolve the rest of the effect, which is return up to two permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. So this is a Sultai card. Yeah, and so if you pay... So it's two green-green on its base, but if you pay blue, black, green, green, you now get to entomb something before you bring it back. So you kind of get to tutor one card and then pull one out of the graveyard, mm-hmm. right? Sort of. It doesn't have to be the card that... The pull, card you pull out does not be the, have to be the one that you tutor, by the way. Right. So um, so there's... I mean, obviously, it's a good value card because you're paying four mana to get some two things back mm-hmm. uh, and, and maybe tutor something out of your deck. I mean, obviously, you have to be in these colors in our format to even play it. Whereas in like standard or limited or whatever, you could play this in a deck that doesn't even have the ability to create black mana, but we can't do that. So in your deck, you're always going to have the ability to cast this for its mythos cost, let's call it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, four mana, tutor one card, regrow one card, you know, pretty good. Regrow two cards. Yeah, that's what I mean. Tutor card, tutor card and regrow card. Now, you can only get permanence back, so it's not exactly tutoring. You can tutor any card to your graveyard, Yeah, but... You can only bring back to your hand permanence. Permanence. Still, I mean, that's just that's just powerful. Like, I, yeah, there's going to be a lot of things you can do with it, but in general, on its face, tutor a card for because people play diabolic tutor. That's four mana tutor one card. <laughs> yeah, right. This is get another card out of your graveyard. Yeah, people compare this to Gerard's orders. Uh, this is just better than Gerard's orders, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Also, like you can tutor a life from the loam, and then you can get any permanence back. So you're you're throwing a thing that's really valuable into the graveyard with dredge, or you can put something in there with escape, a new mechanic from recent years, yep. flashback. Yeah, it works really well with a lot of mechanics. Also, if one of the cards you get back is like Eternal Witness then now you can get the Mythos of Brokos back. And then and then the you process. always have the, you know, Eternal Witness. If it dies again, just keep that. And then you're always getting one additional card. Yeah. So that seems very powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, pretty good. Yeah, I, 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 I think, think we're going to see this quite a bit in this in Sultai decks. Like, this is just good value. Especially because there's so much stuff to put into the graveyard these days now. It's almost better than a straight tutor in some... In, in a lot of instances, it will be. Obviously, it's more expensive, but... Mm-hmm. Tutor, like if you have demonic tutor, but the thing you want in your graveyard, it doesn't help you do that. Well, yeah. this does. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good job, Mythos of Brokos. Good job. Good job. All right, Mythos of Aluna is the teamer version. Two blue, blue. Create a token. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Create a token that's a copy of target permanent. Target permanent. That means lands. If red and green was spent to cast this spell, instead create a token that's a copy of that permanent, except the token has, when this permanent enters the battlefield, if it's a creature, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. So it's a teamer clone of any permanent. It's like clever impersonator, but better in a lot of ways uh, because you can copy the lands. However, you can flicker clever impersonator and reset it. And the red-green part of it, honestly, I don't even see people casting it for that that often. You don't have to, right? Yeah. But if you you do want to clone a creature than being able to just murk another creature on the board. Yeah. And sometimes this is a removal spell for a creature, right? You're like, listen, I'd like to get the token or whatever, but I need to kill that and something the same size of it will do it, so I'll make the token fight, whatever. Fight, kill just it, having yeah. that option, even though that's not the main thing you want to do with it, is is good, right? That's all upside. You yeah. don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mythos is a little worse than regular clones because it does target a permanent. Uh, right. Generally, clones come in and say the copy of any X on the battlefield. Or they enter the battlefield as yeah, a copy. As a copy, yeah. But Mythos here is is pretty interesting. I, I like what I'm seeing at the very least is that you get to make a land if you really want to, and that that seems pretty good. Uh, pretty cool with like Riku because you copy oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Make more. Make uh, more. Doubling season. Oh, it's really good with doubling season. So you create a token that's a copy of target permanent, right? Uh huh. So you cast it. Targeting the doubling season. <laughs> so that makes two copies of doubling, of doubling season. season, right? So, th- but then there's a copy of that because doubling season made a copy of the token, right? Right. So you get the two. Now you have three doubling seasons for the second one to resolve, which makes two, four, six, eight. Oh my God. So by the end of this, you have 11 doubling seasons. Wow. Which is overkill. <laughs> I think three, <laughs> three doubling seasons, whatever you're going to do with those, it was going to win the game Honestly, anyway. Honestly, one doubling season is enough, as we all know. But yeah, three, but because this but makes 11. token copies, yeah, yeah. and it could copy the doubling actual season. doubling season, it does some interesting stuff, yeah. Okay, all right. Good job, Mythos of Luna. <laughs> Definitely not copying creatures, I think, for the most part. But when it does, it's very effective as well, because you can get it to fight if you're paying teamer costs. All right, the next one is more straightforward. It's Mythos of Nethroi. 
Two and a black for an instant. Destroy target non-land permanent if it's a creature or if green and white was spent to cast this spell. Weird wording. What it means is if you just spend two and a black and not green and a blue also, you can only kill a creature. Yeah. But if you spend green, white, and black, all three colors, then you can destroy a non-land permanent. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Instant speed too, nonetheless. It's uh, it's non-land, so it's not as powerful as Vindicate in blowing up land, but it's still, again just a great black and white getting the best removal spells as always yeah it's kind of anguished on making obviously it costs a green mm -hmm. and not a, a colorless or sorry a generic um so it's a little harder to cast but anguish on making deals three damage to you so that's kind of a, a trade-off there but yeah in the abzan colors like i run a lot of anguish on making because the ability to deal with any permanent type obviously not land is just worth one extra mana yeah instant speed too obviously makes a huge deal there yeah yeah so i expect to see that card a bit uh mythos of snapdax is the uh, Mardu one. Two white white for a sorcery. Each player chooses an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker from among the non-land permanents they control, then sacrifices the rest. We've seen this card around. However, if you pay red and black as well to make this a full-on Mardu cost for red, black, white, white, you choose the permanence for each player. So I look at Josh's board and I'm like, you get to keep that signet, your worst creature, and you don't have any enchantments or planeswalkers, sacrifice the rest. Yep. And you do that for every opponent. So this is like Tragic Arrogance, basically. Yeah, Tragic Arrogance is a card that's underrated, I think. Every time somebody's cast it that I've seen, it's been like, oh, crap. Oh, man. Yeah, you get to keep your best board. stuff and we keep our worst stuff? <laughs> that's usually a big swing. And Tragic Arrogance costs five mana. This costs four. So in Mardu decks, I think this is going to be quite good. And you should probably, if you haven't played with a Tragic Arrogance, give it a shot because it's going to be better than you think. I think a lot of people are like, they're still going to have stuff. some stuff left. Yeah. I want to just play a card where they have nothing left. But the fact that you get rid of not just creatures, right? And they keep their worst thing and you keep your best thing. It's usually a big swing in the game. Like I've never seen Tragic Arrogance resolve and it's like, oh, well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> it's always awesome. Yeah, I've seen the Cataclysmic Gear Hulk resolve and everyone yeah. goes, that was bad. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, that didn't work as well. All right, the last one is the Mythos of Vadrock. This might be my favorite art of the three. Mythos of Dadrock is what I've been calling yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's two red red for a sorcery. Mythos of Vadrock deals five damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. Can't hit players. If blue and white was spent to cast this spell, until your end of turn, those permanents can't attack or block, and their activated abilities can't be activated. So Interesting. Next turn. So, yeah, yeah, that gives you immunity for a whole turn against those creatures. And also turns off planeswalkers on their next turn, too, because mm -hmm. you can't hit planeswalkers with it, which is an interesting, I think, aspect of this card. Still... Four mana, five damage total, so you can spread it out, shut down five things, but it's a one-time effect. You could just board wipe, too. Yeah, I wish it was an instant. If it was an instant, I think it gets a lot better. Yeah, totally. But the fact that this is a sorcery, and I gotta do it on my turn. Well, actually, if it's an instant, it's not so great if you're playing Jeskai, because it says until your next turn, so if you do it at the end of your turn before mine, then it's my next turn, and that effect wears off. It's till your next turn as the caster. Yeah, so you'd have to do it on your turn for it to get back to your next turn. True, you do but it on still, like, playing it on your turn, and then your shields are down for the other two players after yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't really part. know that, the end step, or whatever, mm -hmm. or just, like... Just the flexibility of like, I didn't think that was that was going to attack me, but now it is, so I'll kill it, yeah. is worth a lot. Like, I, sorcery, I just hate tapping out and being like, look, I got nothing, and you can see it. Well, not so just that, but me. sorcery plus hate bear type effect, where it's like, I just did, I just shut down half of your board and two cards on yours. Sorry, past yeah. turn. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather do that before <laughs> on my unstep and then untap and be like, whatever, your creatures can block, but I still killed the important thing. Yeah, I like Aurelia's Fury better in general. It's X red white to deal X damage divided amongst any number of targets so it includes players and then tap each creature dealt damage this way kind of similar and yep. players dealt damage this way can't cast non-creature spells this turn so that's a, a kind of a different kind of shutdown but this is instant speed so yeah it's really interesting when you made up when you made that comparison and i, I think i agree i like aurelia's fury it has a lot more upside because x can be any amount so mm -hmm. you can kill people with it yeah i don't think mythos of vadrock is very good I don't think we're probably going to see it much. Okay, at the end of this cycle, which one do you think is the best, Jimmy? I got to go with uh, a mix between Aluna, because I love the fact they can copy lands, and it gives you the ability to fight if you need that, um, or Snap Decks, because I think Tragic Air against... that one. Oh, right, Brokos. I forgot Brokos was even there. <laughs> All right, Brokos clearly is in the lead. <laughs> I agree. And it's then, a tutor. <laughs> it's a tutor, yeah. And then I think it goes Aluna, Snap Decks. Uh, and I think, Black, I think Black that's... Has, yeah, 
I think Nethroy is quite good and will... Maybe that goes down for me because there's so many options already in those colors. It's true, but I think, you know, in a Abzan deck, you just replace, like, Utter End or something with it. Right. So it'll actually... I think we'll see it more than Snapdax, even though, yes, you're correct. Those colors already have options for that. This is better than some of those options, though. Yeah. Interesting. Good job, Mardu. You're getting a little more help. All right, let's go to uh, another cycle here. There are still two cycles left. These last two are pretty similar. This one might be the most exciting for commander players in general. It's pretty exciting. So there's a cycle of triomes, which are lands, and they're tri lands. So they tap for each of the wedge colors. So Indatha traps, uh, taps for Abzan. Uh, they all enter the battlefield tapped, as tri lands always do. So first off, just another tri land in a color that already has a tri land is pretty cool. Yeah, heck yeah. Um, there's Ketria, Rogrin, Savai, and Zagoth. There's Hopefully this will make it easier to get better fixing in your decks. However, it may be tough because these are all rare, and they also have extra text on them that make them really crazy. Yeah, so they're not just tri-lands, right? Just on the base level, that's what they do. Come into play tapped, tap for one of the three colors of the wedge. But they have two other things going for them. One is they all have cycling three. Oof. So for three mana, you can discard this card and then draw a card. It's a hefty cycling uh, amount. You're very rarely going to want to do that because in a commander game, just three mana to draw a card. That's usually not what you want to be doing. But it's there, and it's an option that you could do. I don't think that mm -hmm. increases how good they are by a measurable amount, right? Yeah. They're, they're still not a lot better than a normal Tri-Land just because they have cycling three. A little bit better, but not a lot. But this If last... you had the choice, you would run the cycling one. Yeah, because why not? Yeah. But you're probably going to run both in these three color decks now yep. it gets interesting when you get into four and five color decks you can run a lot of different tri lands now and you probably don't want that many uh lands to come to play tapped mm -hmm. but the last thing about these these triomes these tri lands that's that's the exciting part right is they have basic land types on them oh. so the indatha triome the abzan one is a land plains swamp forest so which that's means crazy. you can fetch for these and a lot of cards, not just regular fetch lands, but, you know, green has cards that say go find a planes card, uh, Chris and Verges and things like that. So yep. they go find specific land types. Types, yeah. And these are the first tri lands we've ever seen that have land types on them and open a sort of a lot of interesting doors. Not to mention they have probably the coolest alternate arts. Have you seen those? They yes. Look amazing. In fact, we have a wall scroll right over there oh, that yeah. you can't see. It's off camera. But yeah, the Ultra Pro made wall scrolls of the Triomes. They all look sweet. There's not much to say about these lands other than the fact that they are staples just off the bat for so many commander decks. Um, it's going to be a sought after card for sure by commander players, uh, especially those alternate arts. The fact that you can fetch them out is going to be negative news for the people that don't have fetch lands because that just makes the fetch lands a little bit more valuable they're already pretty powerful to begin with now they're even better it's interesting because i think these are very good i think we're going to see them quite often but i would say to everybody out there like be careful you don't want a lot of lands to come into play tapped so like in a five color deck i don't think i'm even running all five of them mm -hmm. i'm running a few based on what your land needs are and your color well, needs, the yeah. color spread in my deck is so these are really good because, yes, they are going to make it into decks, but I don't think you're going to run a lot of them in any given deck, right? Mm -hmm. Because, again, be careful that coming to play tap thing. In a lot of cases, maybe they switch out for the cons try lands. You probably don't want, unless it's an Abzan deck specifically, in a four-color and five-color deck, you probably don't want the one that, what's the Abzan one from cons? I don't remember, but doesn't have cycling, doesn't Same have land types. Citadel. There you go. Well, good memory. First picked that one yeah. a lot. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Abzan was the best color. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you probably don't want that and in Datha Triome in uh, a deck that's not Abzan, right? In a four-color yeah. deck or whatever. So, yeah, I, I, listen, these are good. Going to go in a lot of decks. I think it's possible to put too many in your deck and make your deck worse, though, if you're not careful. Yep, but look, if you open a pack and one of these is in there and you have an Abzan deck and you want to put it in there... Um, you should probably should. You should. Probably should, yeah. Now, do you put these in a deck if you don't have fetch lands or things that fetch for land types? Yeah, because you might just need the three-color <clears throat> fixing. I think generally it's okay to have, you know, I don't know, 30%, maybe a little less, maybe like 25% of your land base coming to play tapped. Mm -hmm. You don't really want to go much above that. And so... And you're happiest when they tap for three colors, not like a two-color life land or something. So it, Definitely the, replace a life land with one of these for sure. Yeah, 100%. Because the one life is not worth the extra, the extra color. And now yeah. you've got cycling, even if you can't fetch for them. And if you can fetch for them, then... It's, you know, you shouldn't, you probably don't have lifelines in your deck if you've got fetches, though. I think the big thing to take away from this set, though, is that they are very heavily pushing the wedge colors. Yeah. These are not two color lands. You have to play them in a deck that runs all three. Um, so, as a result, those are the decks that are getting the most help out of it. If you're like a two color deck type player, then these are just not as inherently interesting to you. 
All right, then there is another cycle that has to do with the wedge colors. Yeah, these are the crystal cycles, mm. so it's going to have the same names in Dotha, Ketria, Raugren, Savai, Zagoth. I don't know how they come up with these names, because when you read them, if I had to have you guess, you could probably guess which colors are which, right? I don't know. Like, so it, Do it, because I only know in Dotha is that okay. band, so do one of What do you think Zagoth is? Zagoth. Starts with a Z. That should be your first hint. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's not really a hint. <laughs> yeah, is it uh, Mardu? No. Okay, dang. Maybe I'm wrong. Savai is Mardu. Okay. Okay, how about Ketria? You have a 50-50% chance. No, it's actually Teemer. <laughs> you know what? I'm wrong. <laughs> I guess you could say the same, like, if you told me Abzan. Like Why a don't year... they just name them Jeskai, Abzan? <laughs> I know we're not on cons, but, like, can we just keep it consistent so it's easy to talk about? Well, it's because of the color that focuses on, right? So it's uh, about the enemy color. Okay, sure. Around. Anyway, okay. these are, uh, you see these in a lot of draft sets typically to help support the main colors. They are three mana artifacts that add one of the colors of the wedges, and they also all have cycling two on them so it's a three mana rock it will fix your colors and it also has the ability to cycle for two which is not as aggressive as three i think these are in general in general just pretty pretty okay um if you're fixing for fixing i wish they had cycling in there. one probably too good for limited then probably but, way too good for limited yeah but they would be like maybe borderline playable for us i think like ah. three mana rock is just a tough spot to be in because it's not There's gonna so tap many for options two, too yeah and it's not gonna tap and if it taps for one, then you just want signets and things that, ta right? Fellwar they stones, get their low mind center. stones, arcane signets. Yeah, because you'd rather just have that mana. The cycling, you could say, like helps it out, but cycling two is just too much. I, yeah, I don't think there's are that great. Three mana rocks just generally aren't. In a pinch, maybe you run one of these, but I think there's a lot of better options. Yep. Again, I think this is one of those things. If you're a new deck builder, you're starting out the format, you just bought one of the pre-cons. These are the kind of cards that you can very happily throw into a deck if you, you, know, you have a five mana commander, for instance. That's the yeah. best spot for them. All right. Now we're going to move into the individual colors and the cards that go in those. Um, we're only going to talk about the stuff for the rest of the set that we think is relevant to the commander format. Mm -hmm. So we're going to skip a lot of cards and also, we're also going to skip like incredibly obvious cards. So yes, put the mutate cards in your mutate deck, put the cycling cards in your cycling deck. We're not going to talk about all the cards that have those keywords because we think you can figure that out on your own. And the more interesting conversation <clears throat> too is what do those cards do Uh you know, like how can you abuse the mutate mechanic as a whole, not specifically one mutate card. Yeah, so, exactly. Watch the, the mechanics if, episode. If there's a mutate card that has, like, we think will be more broad in its application and work outside of just a mutate yeah. deck, then maybe we'll talk about it. Yep. All right, let's start with black. All right, we talked about this card already. It's Bastion of Remembrance. It's two in the black and enchantment. It is... It just reads aristocrats on it. When it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token, and whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. So... If you're playing an aristocrat deck, this is it's your this is your boy slash this is your bastion. Everyone's being remembered here. <laughs> Taste of Karlov, you're gonna get double triggers. If you're if you have Blood Artist and Zulapur Cutthroat in your deck, you probably want Bastion of Remembrance. Yep. If right? you have Cruel Celebrant, you better be running this card too. It's it's really good, and the fact that it's an enchantment, I think, makes it you know maybe a little bit better than one of those. Maybe you replace a Zulapur and a Blood yeah. Throat, a Blood Artist, a Cruel Celebrant with this. Um, or just add another. But maybe effect. not because those are creatures and aristocrats decks tend to like be able to regrow their creatures, reanimate them and things like that. Yeah, and, and it needs For black them. to get an enchantment back out of its graveyard is tough. Uh, so maybe you don't, but uh, it's something to consider. It's just another axis to do this aristocrats thing. So yeah. obviously good. Yeah, you can guess, you can use a sun titan to get this kind of card back. But again, because it's an enchantment, it's going to be really hard for people to remove it yep. over just killing your, you know, Zulaport or whatever it is. But look up aristocrats decks because all the cards that go in that We'll go in the Bastion of Remembrance deck. Yeah, they've seen to be. They've been giving a lot of help to aristocrats over yeah. the years. It just seems because it's 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 like you said. It's the theme of you know the abs and color pairings. Yeah, like white, green, and black all play around at the graveyard. Yep. Okay, next up, Call of the Death Dweller. Two in the black for a sorcery. This one's in the uncommon as well. Return up to two creature cards for a total converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Put a death touch counter on either of them, then put a menace counter on either of them. This is actually, I think, really spicy. Yeah, yeah, it's cheating stuff out into play. Uh, Alesha, who smiles at death, is a deck that's already worried about sort of the the 
well, in this case, the power, power of stuff in its graveyard, that lower tends CMC, to be yeah. lower in CMC, yeah. So already putting low CMC stuff in the graveyard to sort of get back out, so I like that. Yeah, and it's up to two, so you can just bring even a card like Alesha back without having to do another card on top of it. Oh, right, you can do one if you want to. Yeah, or you can just throw an Ornithopter into it. So here, I back. like this card that you put on the list, it's super interesting. Yeah, Goblin Chain Whirler. This is totally a Josh Lee Quiet type combo. It's red, red, red for a 3-3 first strike Goblin Warrior. When it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to each opponent and each creature and planeswalker they control. However, Call of the Death Dweller allows you to put a Death Touch counter on either of them or a Menace counter, Menace. So uh, that's just a board wipe on a Goblin Chain Whirler. Yeah, that's pretty awesome because you give it Death Touch before it deals yeah. the damage. <laughs> Bonk. <laughs> that's a, he poisoned his chain before he whipped everybody with it. Yeah, yeah that's that pretty... seems like a limited combo, but it would actually work, right? Mm -hmm. This is That's three mana, destroy everybody else's creatures and not yours, which is very powerful. Yeah, really, really powerful. I like that in general. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can win the game with these types of things too. Sacred Guide uh, plus like uh, Thassa's Oracle. What's Sacred Guide? Sacred Guide's a white... One mana for a 1-1, one, one, and for one in the white, you sacrifice to reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a white card. Put that card into your hand and exile all other cards revealed this way. You make it the only white card in your deck? Make it the only white card in your deck, yeah. Gotcha. And then you Thassa's Oracle and win, or Lab Man, or, or something ha like that. Thassa's already on the battlefield. Well, it comes out with Thassa's Oracle, right? Oh, right. It's two mana, and that's a one mana card. Oh, yeah. And then Cephalid Illusionist and Nomads and Core is another CDH combo. This, again, total three CMC. To immediately just mills you out. Immediately mill yourself out, yeah. Pretty good. Um, I think Call of the Death Dweller is, is for its price, three man to get two things out of your graveyard three with CMC three or less. That seems just really good. Yeah, again, Aristocrats type decks, just baseline, get like Blood Artist and something else back. Yeah. Uh, seems, yeah. Blood Artist and like a um, Viscera Seer type oh, card, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So. All right, the last black card is Extinction Event, three and a black for a sorcery. You choose odd or even, exile each creature with converted mana cost of the chosen value. And don't forget, zero is even. So we've got Yenit, who cares about odd CMC stuff. Mm -hmm. We've got Garuda now, who cares about even stuff. We've got Obosh, who cares about odd stuff. Oh, so yeah, I forgot about There's Obosh. a bunch of cards that can be your commander that care about certain CMCs, um, or Garuda is the companion part. Yeah. The only problem with this card is that, sure, you may exile very few cards from your side of the battlefield, but you could also it could also be true of your opponent's. Right, that's true. <laughs> Maybe they just don't happen to have. And and what we've learned from game nights and watching a lot of gameplay is that there's fantasies of these boards that everybody has, like five or six creatures, mm -hmm. but the reality is most of the time, nobody has more than two creatures. I Maybe. think the real way to abuse this is Extinction Event, buy it back, and then cast it for the other half. Other half. <laughs> so you get, get everything. everything. Yeah, and it's Exile, so that is pretty nice. I like it in like maybe token decks because you're going to create mostly tokens, which you know is even. Right. So you can just blow up all the odd stuff. And, you know, your board's going to be intact most of the time. Yeah, that's why you run, like, a Retribution of the Meek and Token Dex, too, because yeah. of the power uh, limitation there. So, yeah, I, I think this is an interesting board wipe. I don't see it necessarily being played a lot just over no. a regular board wipe. But Exile each Creature is the big deal here. So if Yeah, you it does find, Exile. That's a good point. If you find ways to use this and have fun with it, hey. More power to I'm you. cheering you on. All right, let's move on to green now. Um, the first card is Barrier Breach. Two and a green for an instant. It says exile up to three target enchantments. What? Up to three also. You don't need three targets. What? And it has cycling two. What? Yeah, this is just a very pushed, efficient card, right? At uncommon, no less. So it's going to be really accessible for commander players. This feels like a staple. I, I would play this in a lot of decks. Being able to get three enchantments. Up to, right. And you don't have to. That's yeah. crazy. If it said exile three target enchantments and you had to have three targets then it gets way worse but even the cycling might save it in that instance yeah that's why decimate's so bad sometimes because it's like i don't have targets so i can't yeah. even cast the spell but barrier breach there's going to be enchantments and even if it's two that three mana for two enchantments getting removed is still great value and with the cycling if you're just not in a game where enchantments matter that much you just go okay i'll cash this in and two is yeah. a little more than i would want to pay but it's enough that you can do it on your end step because this is an instant so you're holding up mana anyway. It's better than Return to Dust, that's for sure. Yeah, I like this quite a bit. Doesn't yeah, it exiles to me. too. Yeah, it exiles, yeah. So it hits the gods. Oh, which is that's just a, a good huge point. thing, right? Yeah. Those so, are pretty regular commanders now. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, just, I think, yeah, this card's going into a lot of green decks. I, th I think it's very good. Yeah. Now, here's a question. This or Crocin Grip? 
Uh, probably cross and grip because that sometimes just saves you it, the game. It wins games you would you it, would one hundred percent lose that nothing else could save you. Yeah, even if it's not winning the game and it's stopping you from losing. Uh, whereas barrier breach is just getting rid of problematic things. But the fact again, exiling enchantments, huge deal. Sometimes this is better. I mean, often this is better than cross and grip. It might be closer than we think. Yeah, I think in terms of the because our meta is a little pushed, and in general, I think people's power levels are a bit lower than what we play with. So I think barrier breach is going to be more utilitarian in that way. I mean. The fact that it exiles, whereas Cross and Grip doesn't exile, yeah. so there's there's definitely times where Cross and Grip is not going to solve your problem. Cross and Grip is really just the split second that makes it that yeah. most powerful. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe I mean maybe you need to start running both now. All right, here's a card I want to play in every green deck. <laughs> this, is <a> card, <laughs> this is the jimmiest card. It's a uh, Colossification. It's five green green for an enchantment aura featuring the biggest cat you've ever seen. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Enchant creature, when classification enters the battlefield, tap enchanted creature. So semi-removal spell on the turn you play it if you don't play it on your own creature. Enchanted creature gets plus 20, plus 20, baby. They were like, how, how big can we do here? They like could have you, gone plus 30. You know, they game. started it at like tw 11, 12, and they're like, no, yeah. we can go higher. It's a cat. Make it yeah. bigger. Yeah, we can, I think 20 won't matter. 20's fine. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So it taps the creature you played on, but it... Makes it plus 20, plus 20. Yeah. It's seven mana. <laughs> seven mana, plus 20, plus 20. Uh, I, can, I can't wait to see this in a limited environment where someone casts this to tap a creature down, then they swing for legal. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a massive cat on the other side of the library. I, I think this is secretly a good card in a decent number of situations. So, yeah, you've written down some specific stuff, so let's Sovereigns of Lost of Lara is the one for this. If you, I mean, I think Bant decks that want to have giant enchantment auras. Sovereigns is a 4-5 for 4, a blue and a white. That's a exalted creature. Some reason not flying. It's literally in the clouds. Yeah, that's weird. Whenever a creature you control attacks alone, you may search your library for an aura card that would enchant that creature, put it onto the battlefield attached to that creature, then shelf your library. So this gets around the tap clause. Very yeah, common. you're already attacking, so... Tapping it now does nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just a 24, 25 creature. That's pretty good. Yeah. You wrote down Bruna Light of Alabaster, I think, which is also basically the same thing. Uh, however, this has to be in the 99. Yeah, because it doesn't have green in it. But Bruna sort of snags all the stuff yeah. and brings it to her. So she, you'd cast it on another creature, attack with Bruna, and then it switch it, it over. It switches over, yeah. yeah. Storm Herald is a card that I really like in red. It's 3-2, two, 2 in a red for a 3-2 haste, human shaman. And when it enters the battlefield, you return any number of aura cards from your gravity to the battlefield attached to creatures you control. Woo! Exile those auras at the beginning of the next end step. So That's you can just... Cheat the cost. Yeah, cheat the cost, smack in for a butt ton of damage. Uh, giving this card flash is really, really good. So Sigarda Zade. Yeah. Uh, also, just Vidalcan Ori, Leyline of Anticipation. Mm -hmm. But Cigar's Aid, though, says you may cast ore and equipment spells as though they had flash. It's a one man enchantment. Yikes. Um, and then, whenever an equipment enters the battlefield under your control, you may attach it to target creature you control. But the fact that you could swing with like your commander, mm -hmm. that literally is like a 2 2, and they're like, okay, like Hapatra. <laughs> okay, take no it. No blocks. Because no one's thinking you're swinging with a Patra because you're going to kill them right now. Yeah, right? you're just getting a little incidental so it's like turn damage eight, in. Got Vidal Canori out. I've had this situation come up many times, and you're just swinging in with your Hapatra, and they have like a small creature or something because the board got wiped or whatever happened, right? And they're just like, okay, I take it because it's two, and you just go Colossification, you're dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's instant commander damage, right? Yeah. Plus twenty, plus twenty. Yeah. Unless your commander has zero power on it, this will kill them if it hits pretty nuts yeah and it's a cat too um obviously you want to you know if you want to use these creatures to do even more damage you have your flings of the world your chandra's ignitions um chandra's ignition is so good because you can do that the turn you play it and just yeah it makes cre target creature deal damage equal to its power to each creature other and creature and opponent each opponent yeah if you like have a xenagos classification chandra's oh ignition <laughs> that's that's the that's game. game spike shot goblin and spike shot elder are two cards that deal damage equal to its power to creatures or players or any target spike right shot they kind of tim but they oh yeah. spike shot elder is really good because you don't have to tap it you don't you have to activate it. it yeah yeah it's one red red spike shot elder deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player mm -hmm. so if you had enough mana just classification it pay three mana deal 21 to somebody if you had more mana deal three more man you know what i mean yeah 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 spike shot elder doesn't so tap. much damage yeah the only thing about classification is it doesn't give trample um yep. which I, I guess is fair <laughs> it's a seven I, mana enchantment. the other thing is that it's seven mana and yeah. it's an aura so i think it's totally fair but there is cool stuff you could do with it yeah okay we've talked enough about that cat <laughs> yeah but it's pretty cool meow meowza all right the next one is migration path three and a green for a sorcery 
Search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. So it's just explosive vegetation, except it has cycling two. You can pay two, discard this card, and draw a card. So it's just strictly better explosive vegetation. Yeah, explosive vegetation has been 100% outclassed. That doesn't mean you can't run both. I don't think you do. In general, you don't even run explosive vegetation. It, explosive vegetation was already the worst of these, right? There was Circuitous Route, Sky Shroud Claim. Mm-hmm. And now there's Migrations Path. So you're definitely not running four of that effect. And Explosive Vegetation is the worst. The worst of them, yeah. I think Sky Shroud is probably still my favorite because you can get... They forests. come and play untapped. Yeah, you can also get the Triumphs that we just saw earlier. That's so. true. It's not Basics. Yeah, then Circuitous Route. Gets Gates. Is Migrations case. Path better than Circuitous Route? I mean, I don't see that many Gate decks running around. So if, if you don't... Yeah, it's true. I, I guess Migrations Path is just... Because Cycling is just more broad than getting a Gate. And a lot of times when you draw a Circuitous Root or Explosive Veggies turn six or seven, you're like, I'm never casting this. Yeah, I don't need it. Especially like a turn 10. You're yeah. definitely not casting it. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the cycling actually matters a lot. Yeah, I think this is probably after Sky Shroud can't claim the next, you know, best iteration of it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. Next up is a really interesting one. It's Ram Through. One in the green for an instant. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. If the creature you control has trample, excess damage is dealt to that creature's controller instead. So this fight spell has trample. Yeah. It's kind of a green fling. It feels like an unstable card almost. Yeah. It, well, those unstable cards had, we're going to talk about it later because yeah. the red one. They, they're clearly trying to, what was the super duper death ray? Super duper death ray, yeah. It was a... A burn spell that had trample yeah so this is saying fight with trample but now excess damage is going to hurt the the opponent and we're going to see they're playing a little around with uh trample tribal mm -hmm. there's a few other cards that care about if your creatures have trample and they do similar things they're trying to make trample maybe a little better if you had a deck with a lot of trample this could be a kill a target opponent fling type card yeah again with classification type stuff it would even work right it's an instant yep has to be a target you have to target another creature when you do it but if they have just like a 1-1, one, one, you're like, boom. Yeah, hit you for a ton. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I, I like this in, ter in terms of fight spells. This is one of the better ones I've seen from green, and it's a common. Xenagos, really good in Xenagos. <sighs> so many things are good in Xenagos in this set. All right, one more green card. It's called Thwart the Enemy. This is two and a green for an instant. Prevent all damage that would be dealt this turn by creatures your opponents control. I wanted to bring this up because it's very similar to Obscuring Haze. Right. Which is the green force of spell from the C20. Uh, obscuring Haze, I'll read. Just for comparison, two and a green for an instant. If you control your commander, you may cast this spell without paying its mana cost and then prevent all damage that would be dealt this turn by creatures your opponents control. So two things I'm noticing here. One is that it looks like, you know, to improve fogs, because fogs usually go in a lot of sets but are completely unplayable and limited and nobody ever uses them, really. There's a turbo fog deck like once a decade. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah. Uh, they're making them cost three now instead of two but there's making them only affect creatures your opponents control right which is a big upside because you can still kill their creatures like one-sided fog now yeah but also something we didn't bring up with obscuring haze that is a little bit interesting and is also true with thor the enemy is that it's not combat damage mm -hmm. so it says prevent all damage that would be dealt this turn by creatures your opponents control so these are actually a little better than than even most fogs because chandra's ignition it stops damage from right. It stops like Tim damage or whatever. It yeah. stops. It stops non. It stops Nekusar. Red, yeah, red base decks too. That off like. Yeah, it would stop. It would stop that spike shot elder. So mm -hmm. th these are maybe a little bit. The obscuring haze, maybe not thwart the enemy, is a little bit better than we gave it credit for. Again, because we didn't really hone in on the fact that it's non combat. Non combat, damage. So, yeah. Now that's going to be niche. That's not going to come up all the time. But just that little added bonus from it might you know make it a little better than we had mentioned earlier yeah it's like the cards that say like all your opponents and you have just one opponent there's like small little text things that you'll see on cards if you're paying attention that'll help you gain a little extra edge in terms of evaluating them all right we're going to continue we've still got red we've got blue we've got white we've got multicolored cards there's still a lot to talk about but before we get into all that we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors it feels like i've hit a string of bad luck recently what happened this time? Well, someone hacked my Nintendo Switch account and they spent like $200 on Fortnite V-Bucks. <laughs> I did read about this. There was like over 150,000 accounts hacked, right? Yep. 
and no one knows how they did it, but it made one thing clear. We're all vulnerable and stuff like this happens all the time. I need to do a better job taking care of my online identity and ExpressVPN is one of the best ways to do that. Yeah, it turns out even if you're doing things like switching to incognito mode on your browser, it honestly doesn't do much. Your internet service provider still knows exactly what you're up to and where your traffic is going. So ExpressVPN really is a necessary step to make sure that your connection is private and encrypted. That's right. VPNs are virtual private networks, which you can use in a lot of different ways online, but what they're especially great at is privacy protection. ExpressVPN is a necessary step to make sure that your connection is private and encrypted. And let's face it, you really can't be too safe about that kind of stuff these days. Head on over to expressvpn.com slash commands, and for a limited time, you can get up to three months extra for free if you sign up for a 12-month subscription. And that comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so it's absolutely risk-free. Go to expressvpn.com slash command and start protecting your online identity today. All right, we are back and we are discussing all of the new playable cards that are not legendary from Ikoria Lair of Behemoths. We've already had some heavy hitters already. We're moving into red. Yep. How hopeful are we, Josh? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I can see the paper. There's not very many cards, unfortunately. <laughs> so not that helpful. Yeah. There's three. We're going to talk about three red cards By here. the way, green and blue is still the longest list on our page. Yeah, big surprise. Uh, let's lead it off, though, with potentially one of the better cards uh, red seen for this specific tribe that hasn't existed before it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of qualifiers. There are a lot of qualifiers, yeah. As soon as they started talking, I was like, uh-oh, Jimmy, you're digging yourself into a hole. Time to start digging out of it. Everquill Phoenix. Two red red for a 4-4 creature Phoenix with Mutate for three and a red. We're not going to explain how that works. You can just watch our video on that. It has flying, and whenever this creature mutates, create a red artifact token named Feather with one mana. Sacrifice Feather. Return target Phoenix card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. If there was ever a time for a legendary Phoenix, you would think this would be it. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I don't know that it, 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 yeah, if it was legendary, that'd be a lot better just because it would make maybe Phoenix tribal. Yeah, more you can return thing. all your Phoenixes, and there's a bunch of them that all like to come back anyway. But it, it has to mutate. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, you've got to have a mutate Phoenix deck, which doesn't seem doable. Like, yeah, it's too bad. Um, it's, it's a interesting thing but how many phoenixes can you have in a deck that also has mutate right yeah that's actually a really good point and they have to be mono red if this is a legendary type thing like what do you do you make a phoenix tribal deck um you, it seems like it would be really hard to do if you can like find a way to double your little feather tokens also why are they called feather tokens when there's a called feather the redeemed yeah that bugs me let's not get into they've it got a feather but i mean i think like they could take this and retool it for a future phoenix tribal commander and yeah. this idea is like in a, a direction that i like but this card specifically not really yeah i like the idea if red is not going to have card draw maybe they're all about finding ways to hastily bring stuff back from the graveyard with slight you know i mean phoenix is makes sense right because they are the thing that comes back that red has yeah so being able to lean into that maybe in the future maybe in the future all right uh, the next one is flame spill and we only want to talk about this card for one reason. <laughs> it's two and a red for an instant. Flame, spiel, flame spill deals four damage to target creature. But it says excess damage is dealt to that creature's controller instead. Ah. So this is super duper death ray. Yeah. Almost exactly. Right? Almost exactly. Same mana cost, also an instant, same amount of damage, but it, it doesn't have trample anymore. They, they had a problem. I remember I saw some Twitter conversation where Mark Rosewater was talking about how like just giving trample to an instant or sorcery has problems, had like a bunch of rules problems. So they just had to word it this way. But this is basically an, a burn spell with trample, which yeah. is cool. Because Trample says this spell can deal excess damage to a target's controller, and that's just sort of written out a little more. So that, yeah. that's nice. This next one, actually, I like this a lot. Yeah. Uh, also drawn, drawn by Jen Ravenna, one of my favorite artists. Shout out. Footfall Crater, one red enchantment aura. Enchant land. Enchant land has tap. Target creature gains Trample and haste until end of turn. And you can cycle it for one mana. The one cycling makes it a big deal, too. But yeah. this is... um, This is a sort of sneaky, sneaky, powerful effect. The fact that it gives Trample. Yeah. So this is strictly better than a card called Racecourse Fury, which mm -hmm. only gave uh, haste and didn't have cycling, but also was an enchant land. Now, you do lose the land whenever you tap it for this ability. It basically costs you the one mana, right? But this makes your board all of a sudden way scarier than it was before. Well, it makes your hand way scarier than it was before. Right, your hand, Because yeah, yeah, yeah. anything you play all of a sudden is like attacking now with trample. If you have, uh, you know, on attack triggers or combat damage triggers... Mm -hmm. 
in your deck, then this feels like a card you're going to want. I mean, we've known haste is really good for a long time. And it's one of the things a lot of decks, like we're always saying, oh, Concordant Crossroads or Chroma's Memorial in non-red decks. Red has a lot of haste granters, but I like this one because it's pretty low impact and pretty easy. And, And also the cycling just makes it like... Like, if you already have that effect, right? You already got anger in your graveyard yep. somehow or whatever. You're like, okay, sweet. Because double haste doesn't do anything. <laughs> I'll just cycle this away. Well, like, decks like Kiki Jiki, too, you're not looking to make your whole board hasty. Because right. Kiki Jiki Kiki's makes the card. It. Yeah, so you just want... Like, normally you'd be playing the Praetor that gives cards, but that costs way more mana and is a lot easier to interact with. Footfall Crater does that just on the land, uh, and it can also cycle, which is kind of cool. I wanted to give Murph a shout-out here because he plays a card a lot, a lot, or he likes a card a lot, called Crashing Drawbridge. <laughs> I've never seen this thing which in my is life. Two mana for a zero four wall with defender, and you tap it, and it says creatures you control. Oh. All creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. And That's he uses cool. it as like a, a cheap Akrama's Memorial, and it's colorless. Mm-hmm. And I think Footfall Crater is like a little bit better than that if you have red. Obviously, Crashing Drawbridge has the advantage of being colorless. Yeah, it can um, go in any deck that needs haste. White yeah. now has a haste enabler. And generally, like it's cool that this cre- this thing says, sorry, Crashing Drawbridge says creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. But the reality of the situation is you rarely play multiple creatures in the same turn that you want to give haste yeah you know it's usually one unless you're spitting out a ton of tokens yeah yeah the cool thing about footfall crater though uh is look it says enchanted land has target creature gains trample oh you can give it to your opponents yeah so that is the type of thing you could work together with like hey there's a planeswalker or hey you know we need to knock them down or you can maybe kill the arch enemy player i'll give it haste you play it yeah, that's cool. Echoes of a very similar card that does that is Kenrith the Returned King. But yep. for red, his ability is way crazier. It's all creatures gain trample and haste until end of turn. But Footfall Crater could be one of those things where it's like, I'm going to flash out a blocker to make sure I don't take you know lethal from this thing. It's like, haha, no more. Give yeah. a trample. Um, good in the Xenagos deck, again, just because the trample is something Xenagos is looking for. Yeah, Prosh, Samut, all of those decks want this kind of card. All right, that was it for red. We tried to spend as much time as we yeah, could. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're talking about uh, we're talking about a burn spell with trample in there, so <laughs> we're trying to stretch red as far as we can go. Uh, this card was made in unstable ones. <laughs> All right, let's move on to blue, which has surprise, surprise, more cards that we're going to talk about than red does. All right, it, the first one is Escape Protocol. It's one in a blue for an enchantment. Whenever you cycle a card, you may pay one. If you do exile target artifact or creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So this is a blink Mm -hmm. effect tied to cycling, and it doesn't come back at end step. Comes back right away. Yeah, you do have to pay one, so that sets it apart from Astral Drift and Astral Slide, which says at the beginning of the next end step. Mm -hmm. But this is still, if you are in a cycling deck, an auto-include. So uh, Makes your stuff nearly impossible to remove. Yeah, it's also target artifact or creature, so you can cycle uh, anything that's a soul ring plus that gets two or more mana is going to get you a positive net gain from this. Now, because it comes back right away, they can obviously wrath or something, but if they target something, you just blink it out, and now it's a new permanent coming back in. Yeah, also just of course value with etbs and stuff yeah cycling deck yeah it's gonna run that thing for sure hit artifacts so that's pretty neat i'm you put this next one down on the list which i'm surprised because the the this guy? the old version of it is like a card i always try and use but yeah it just never works out well it works sometimes but it's 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 definitely a me type of card <laughs> it's glimmer bell bing, bing, boom, bing. <laughs> one, one in the blue for a one three elemental jellyfish here we go it's got flying, and if for one in the blue, you can untap Glimmer Bell. And this is very similar to what card is it, Josh? Horseshoe Crab. Yeah. Anything Which, where you can pay a mana and untap it, you can shenanig- You can go into shenanigans. Yeah. With it. Like <laughs> you can they, do some things. Yeah. This is just you put certain auras or equipment or give it tap abilities, and all of a sudden you're untapping. There's even stuff within this set you can do that's interesting. Yeah. Parcel Beast? Yeah. So if you put Parcel Beast, you mutate it onto Glimmer Bell. Parcel Beast gives the ability... Pay one, tap it, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it on the battlefield tapped. And if you don't put that card onto the, uh, if you don't put the card on the battlefield, you put it into your hand. So it kind of like, um, what, Coiling Oracles. Coiling Oracles, but it's a main ability too, so you can just see a land and be like, I don't want that on the battlefield for some reason. No, you're always going to do it. <laughs> but yeah, with Glimmer Bell, then you pay the two, untap it, pay one more, do it again. Yeah. It's better on Horseshoe Crab. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, usually when you're doing this, you have a ton of mana or even infinite mana. And this yeah. is just like draw your whole deck in those in that case, right? Yeah. 
it's it's cool. It's also a little cheaper than uh, the horseshoe crab. It's one in the blue. It's a flyer, so maybe it's just another option. It does cost one more, but if you have some sort of way, like training grounds, to make it cheaper, then then you're then you're in horseshoe crab territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's where everybody wants to be. All right, all right. The next one is called Mystic Subduel. It's one in a blue for an enchantment aura with flash. Enchant creature, enchanted creature gets negative two, negative O, and loses all abilities. All right, so this is kind of like a dark steel mutation. It's got flash at instant speed here for an enchant creature to just get rid of it, pretty much. Um, it doesn't change its power or toughness, but it loses its abilities. So I mean, it changes power by negative two. Right, right, right. Yeah, the thing about dark steel mutation and imprisoned by the moon, which I think this is a song of the dryads, too, right. are sort of analogs to this. This keeps it a creature, so if it's their commander, they can always kind of swing in or block with it or something. Sack it. And sack it and, and still get it killed. But this does, like, stop certain combos because mm -hmm. it's got flash. So with certain timings, you can maybe, like... Because the lose abilities, like, let's say it's Kiki-Jiki or something. You tap Kiki-Jiki to make a copy of Pestermite. In response to the Pestermite trigger, you... Mystic Subduel before Mystic the Subduel battlefield. Kiki, and now Kiki... Yeah, untaps, but can't tap again mm -hmm. to make another Pestermite. So you just stop that combo. And there's some um, usages of this card, you know, in that vein that I think are good. I think it's usable. It's two mana. With People are saying that this is maybe CEDH playable. Yeah. Because it's, it's two mana. Enough. And it's flash. And it can come out of nowhere. And again, it's protection to make sure that you get your win con or you're stopping someone else's. Yeah, yeah. So, I can totally see that. I mean, I think more people should play Imprisoned in the Moon, so seeing cards like Mystic Subdue will make me a little happier. I mean, I like this better than Imprisoned in a lot of cases because the Flash is such a big deal. Yeah. Reality Shift is a card we've talked about a lot. Rapid Hybridization is a card we see a lot in our meta. And uh, uh, there's the other Reality one. Reality Shift? Well, no, I said that first, but what's the uh, other one that's uh, like Rapid Hybridization? There's another Pongify? one, Blue Mana, Pongify. Yeah. And those cards are all similar to this, but, you know... They don't get something new. Imprison the Moon gives them a land, by the yeah, way. Like, yeah. kind of ramp. <laughs> I like Imprison the Moon just because it's very flexible, but... Yeah. Yeah, maybe I like this a little better, I think. All right, this next card straight up obliterates an old card out of existence because it is strictly better. It's Reconnaissance Mission, and it's actually a very welcome... I guess you would call it, like, a... It's kind of a reprint in a way, but just better. Yeah. <laughs> it's two blue blue for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card and you can cycle it for two. So astute viewers out there will be screaming Coastal Piracy, yep. which is an older, more expensive version. This card is now an uncommon. So congrats. We have a better version of that now because of cycling. And maybe you want two in some of your decks. Yeah, totally. So there you go. Uh, decks like Alela, Artful Provocateur. Oh, yeah. A lot of fairies running around. Going to draw a lot of cards. Yep. Uh, Locust God. God. Oh, God. Fighting the Fossa oh, does a God. similar thing too. Yep. Tetsuo Umazawa, right? You just have tons of unblockable one threes. I, I see cards like this in Brea decks as well. Just ways to get more more cards drawn because you're always making low evasive threats. You mean Tetsuko? I was like Tetsuko. Te that's right. Tetsuo is the old legend. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I misspelled it. That one K makes a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's the next card. The here? next card may be the memeiest card of the set. Yeah, it's the Sharknado card. <laughs> it's it is just Sharknado. It's when I saw this, I laughed like out loud. Like this is you know weeks ago when we saw yeah. the set. I was like, they actually did it. The Mad Men. It's called Shark Typhoon, <laughs> five and <laughs> blue for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX blue shark creature token with flying, where X is that spell's converted mana cost. Huh. So it's kind of like, what was the one? The artifact one? The, yeah, every time you cast an art. Yeah, oh shoot. It I was makes just artifact, thinking about it, yeah. And then you win the game at a certain point too. It's like metal, metallurgic summonings, I think. Ah, uh, yes. Summon yeah. the constructs. Yeah, so this is like that for non-creature spells, but it has additional text. So you can, it also has cycling for X, one, and blue. So you pay one blue and X, discard this card, draw a card, and then when you cycle Shark Ty Typhoon, create an XX blue shark creature token flying. So at instant speed, and it's also not a spell that can be countered, mm -hmm. you can create a flying XX uh, if you don't want to cast this as an enchantment, which I don't know why you wouldn't, but maybe, you know, you draw yeah. on it. You might need a flash. Almost dead. It's a flash flying blocker, right? Yeah, or a flash flying surprise attacker. Like mm -hmm. on your end step, boom, I make a 7-7 seven, seven flyer, you're at seven, I attack you now. You didn't see that coming. Ha! <laughs> so two in the blue basically is the baseline for that for a 1-1 one, one flying that draws you a card. Right? Not the worst. Not the worst. I mean, three and a blue for a 2-2 two, two flying that draws you a card is like getting... It's one mana short of Moldrifter and one card short of Moldrifter. 
<laughs> the mold drifter is the I golden mean, standard. Yeah, the mold drifter is the golden standard. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're only going to want to do that in a pinch. Shark Typhoon by itself is just good in those decks. Again, six man value, just making free free like, sharks. XX flyers. Yeah, yeah, XX flying sharks too. Yeah, you're making free shark. Yeah, yeah shark nato. A lot of jokes. Okay. okay. Next up, we have uh, voracious great shark keeping on the shark train. Three blue blue for a five four creature shark with flash. When voracious great shark enters the battlefield, counter target artifact or creature spell. It's a creature counter. Yes. Very exciting. Uh, I like this card. Be, I, I like this card in a lot of decks. Um, it's kind of like what, what Mystic Snake or something like that. It's a little bit more um, It's a little more narrow. pricier. Yeah. yeah. It's a little pricier and a little more narrow, but those cards everybody doesn't have. And I think cards like this are definitely playable if you have a lot of instant speed stuff in your deck. And then also you get added upside if you have the ability to send it back to your hand like Crystal Shard. Yeah. Uh, we saw me using that and... Krim using that in one of the um, Game Nights episodes. So this is a thing where if you have six mana out in a crystal shard, nobody can even cast a creature spell because they know you can bounce this back to your hand and play it and counter the thing in response, which mm -hmm. a lot of times just that sitting out on the table will stop them from doing those things and you don't even have to counter the stuff. They'll counter themselves. Yeah, that's like the rune type decks love this kind of thing, right? Yeah. Where it's just like, all right, everyone, you can't do anything anymore. Yeah, you're just like, hey, go ahead. But for free, I'll just counter it. Yeah. And then you can also like Eldrazi Displacer because anything that flickers this instantly. instantly actually, the re, what was the... Escape Protocol. Escape Protocol would do it Cycling, too. flickering it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you cycle, you flicker this thing, it comes back immediately, enters the battlefield, counters their thing. There's a lot of stuff you can do with cards like this. Obviously, this is not the first card that's done this. Like yeah. Venzer Shaper Savant's a really good one too because it doesn't counter, but it bounces it back to their hand. But I do like this effect and, you know, this is a... This is it's a cool usable card. card. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely usable. Five man's a little bit, but again, re repeatable Mystic Snake effects, especially if you're mono blue here. Very powerful. Just letting them see it is really good. Like, they're staring at it, and they're like, crap, if he's got any sort of Oh, crap, that's a great shark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's definitely going to bounce that back. How is that shark counter. countering things? It's All right. It. Let's move on to white. Uh, a, cu a couple really spicy ones. Yeah, this one may be the most talked about card in the commander circles. It is Dranith Magistrate. One in a white for a 1-3 human wizard. So all you wizard decks celebrate. Mm -hmm. Your opponent can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. Now this, I do not believe, was designed with commander in mind, but it definitely affects commander quite a bit because your commander is not in your hand. Yeah, I mean, I think they designed it knowing how it would work in Commander, but mm -hmm. they didn't. They weren't. They weren't like, hey, let's design a card that makes it hard for people to cast their commanders. Right. They were just like, yeah, is that fine? And it is fine. I think I a think lot of people fine. were worried about it, but it's a creature. Like you could already play like Nevermore, or you could play um, Meddling Mage and things. Gaddic like that. Teague can sometimes just shut down the entire commanders yeah. too, right? So this is a type of effect that I, it's a hate bear effect for sure. People are going to groan when they see it. Here's the thing. This should be a signal to you, and you should have already learned this from our show, but you need to be playing more interaction in your deck. <laughs> to get rid of these creatures, You yeah. need to have the ability to remove permanence in play single, singly for cheaper than your board wipes or whatever you've got right now. Because there's just a lot of cards that are going to come out, and if you can't remove it, then your game plan's offline. And this is just another one, and it's pretty easy to remove as a 1-3. Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to be a speed bump too for like some decks that just want to slow down other decks enough so that they can, you know, keep Get up in going. the game. Yeah. yeah, I like. I actually kind of like it. I it's, think it's fun, right? You're, if you're playing it against a super fast meta, and all of a sudden everyone has to sit and twiddle their fun thumbs and think, "Hey, I want to remove that, but if I do, then Kyle Hill's going to go off." So yeah. maybe we just keep this around for a little bit. And I'm going to build my resources and give me a better chance. I actually like the effect this creates. Think about like really like decks like the Narset deck. Oh, gosh, you know, yeah. Narset doesn't have a lot of pinpoint removal, and so you put this out there, and they're just like, ugh. ugh. And that's that's a good deck to turn off, because mm -hmm. I don't like that deck very much. So Even if the the card is on the battlefield, like the Narset, all of a sudden they can't cast spells, right? So that yeah. turns out that part of Narset, too, outside of just casting the commander. Um, cast Distant Mage is also one that messes with this quite a bit. Well, cast because you cast cards out of your graveyard. You can't do that. Yeah. Herador, you cast your creatures out of your graveyard. You can't do that. Yeah. Um, knowledge Pool is really disgusting with this card, because yeah. uh, when it enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top three cards of the library, and then whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, that player exiles it. If the player does they may cast a spell from among other cards exile with knowledge pool without paying its mana cost but except yeah Dread magistrate says no to all of that so you just stop you lock the entire table well yeah you're the only one that can cast spells now yeah and everybody else can't that's a win which doesn't bother me too much as a two card 
combo it's also win. A six mana artifact and knowledge pool. There yeah. are faster ways to you lose. You could already the game. do it with Teferi, but they mm -hmm. were more expensive. This makes it a little cheaper because uh, Dranath Magistrate is only two mana. Yeah. Listen, that's not a fun combo. It's the type of combo you pull off against your playgroup a couple a couple times and then you kind of stop doing it unless you're in a very powerful meta, in which case they ha they know that's coming. They hold up counter spells, they know yeah, how they to can stop fight it. Against it. Yeah. I don't mind this card. I don't think these are the type of cards that fix white though, because no. Here's what really happens when you play Dranath Magistrate. Everyone gets angry at you? Yes. <laughs> it's just like Spirit of the Labyrinth or these cards. It's like, hey, let's even out Grand White's Abolisher. card draw by making cards that they can play that stop everybody else from drawing cards. The thing is, if Jimmy plays Ristic Study and he's drawing a lot of cards off of it, I'm mad about Ristic Study. If he plays Spirit of the Labyrinth and he's stopping everybody at the table from drawing cards, I'm mad at Jimmy. And I'm gonna So the, the response is either kill Ristic Study in one case, yeah. but the other response is, oh, kill Jimmy. And that's that's why Dranath Magistrate, be careful. You put it out there, people are going to be like, well, I don't have creature removal, but I might have player removal. Yeah, I would also be really wary of playing this kind of card too much in lower-powered playgroups, because this is the kind of thing where I think if I started playing the game you know, today and saw this, I'd be like, that's unfair, I don't like that. Yeah. So that's kind of, you're, you can expect that kind of emotion towards this type of thing, because it does kind of shut off one of the main concepts of Commander, which is your Commander. But if your playgroup is intermediate, you know, yeah. there's more veteran players. I mean, if you're that using card it is going to be mildly annoying. To like stall or whatever. Cool. Sometimes it'll be sweet. It'll be the perfect play. It'll stop them for just long enough. Mm -hmm. But like good decks are going to have removal, should have removal. And if they don't, they're probably not considered a good deck. Yeah. And this again affects all of your opponents, not just one. So that's the risk you run here. All right. The next one is called Fight as One. It's one white mana for an instant. And the fact that it's only one white mana for an instant is the reason we're going to talk about it. You can choose one or both. Either target human creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and gains indestructible until end of turn, or target... N sorry, and or. You could choose both of these. Yeah. Target non-human creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and gains indestructible until end of turn. So you can protect two things or only one thing. Uh, give it indestructible is really what you're doing here for just one mana. Yeah, no matter what, you're going to be able to give something indestructible because it's either human or non-human. Uh, this is obviously pretty darn good in decks like Kalia of the Vast, where mm -hmm. she's putting out a definitely non-human while she is a human. And also she often has to just swing in to get her trigger, yeah. regardless of whether you can block. Uh, and then Feather, the Redeemed, oh, yeah. really likes this card as well. Yep. Um, again, I think just instant speed given destructible at one mana, potentially repeatable in Feather decks, makes it a card that you will see in that kind of archetype. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we got Lava Brink Venturer. Two and a white for a 3-3 three, three human soldier. As Lava Brink Venturer enters the battlefield, choose odd or even. Lava Brink Venturer has protection from each converted mana cost of the chosen value. Don't forget, zero is even. So this is a definitely a Voltron-type creature. You want to strap this up with some equipment and make it really unblockable or very protected, then that's a way to do it. It's... It's otherwise, it's not terribly impressive. I'm I'm not in love with the card, but I like that Wizards is sort of playing with the even odds things in the world. There's something interesting to that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say about this card. There's more and more cards where they're referencing even or odd CMCs mm -hmm. or, yeah, and that's just another angle they can design stuff. So we'll see. You have to see where they go with it. All right, the next and final white card is one of the coolest cards in the set. Uh, I don't know why it's not legendary. It's Luminous Brood Moth. It's Mothra. Brood Mothra. Yeah, there are Mothra versions of this card. Which is really strange considering it's not legendary now. Yeah, how could Mothra not be legendary? All right, we're just going to have to let that go. All right, so Dude, two... Supports always get trashed on in these types <laughs> yeah, of games. Yeah, that's messed up. Two white white for a 3-4 flying insect creature. Whenever a creature you control without flying dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a flying counter on it. Hmm. So it's unflying. Unflying, not undying. I like that. It's um, so th this is just powerful on its surface because any mechanic we know, persistent and undying are one of the most two of the mu most abusable mechanics that have ever been created. And anything where it's like, hey, something dies and it comes back, regardless of what happens. Yeah, it's gonna be know, it's gonna be strong. It's here. gonna be strong. And this is actually, in a lot of ways, like even stronger because there's a lot of ways to play around with plus one and negative one counters for undying and persist. And there's actually surprisingly a lot of ways to mess around with these flying counters or just flying in general. Yeah. One of the big things that people say is like, well, what happens if the creature comes back, but it doesn't, you can find a way to, to get rid of that flying counter or not have it be placed on it. And then the creature dies again. Well, guess what? You've created a loop. Yep. 
So Solemnity is the main one that people are talking about. It's two and away from the enchantment. Players can't get counters. Sorry, Craig. And counters can be put on artifacts, creatures, enchantments, or lands. So this could hose your opponents, but more specifically with Luminous Broodmoth, you play a creature, you sack it, it dies, it comes back with a flying counter, but Solemnity says no, you can just repeat that again, and boom, you have an infinite sack recursion outlet right there. Yeah, if you're sacking to an altar, then it's infinite mana. If you're sacking to, I don't know, something else where you have a Blood Artist out or a Bastion of Remembrance, mm -hmm. well, you just kill everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sun Cleanser is a card from M19 that's one in white for a 1-4. When it enters the battlefield, you choose one. Remove all counters from target creature. It can't have counters put on it for as long as Sun Cleanser remains on the battlefield. Or target opponent loses all counters. That player can't get counters for as long as Sun Cleanser remains on the battlefield. So this would remove the flying counter from something. However, when it dies and comes back, it's a new permanent. So Sun Cleanser wouldn't keep the counter from being put on again and again. Yeah, but when Sun Cleanser and just Luminous Broodnoth when it enters the battlefield, you can choose to remove all counters from card creature, and then you can just choose itself. Yeah, exactly. So you can sack the Sun Cleanser over and over. Yeah. And if you're sacking to, like, Altar of Dementia... Everyone's milled. Everyone's milled out. One I, card at a time. What's with that like? Cleanser. That's never happened to me before. <laughs> yeah, that's ne never. Uh, McKay's the Unhallowed. Again, another great example with Solemnity and Luminous Broodmoth. Just like, you know, whenever a human deals damage, you destroy it. But more importantly, other non-human creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and have Undying. So that means even the Luminous Broodmoth is coming back. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about if you can have a creature with Undying that doesn't have Flying Out, you'll get two triggers, right? When that dies. Oh, from McKay's and the Broodmoth. So you'll... And you can stack them how you want. So the first time, it comes back with Undying and gets the counter. Ah. The next time, it comes back because of Luminous Broodmoth and gets the fl the flying counter. And the next I time, see. the Undying. And so you can ping pong because you stack both those triggers, the one goes off, and then the second one goes off, but it doesn't see the creature in the graveyard anymore because it's already on the battlefield. So you don't also add You don't the add the counter? You get oh, to add one or the it's other. It's gone. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. So you can sort of ac accomplish the same thing as Solemnity or whatever. Right, right. Now, this has a really interesting combination with Mystic Decree and Gravity Sphere, which are world enchantments that say all creatures lose flying. However, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't work in the way that you might want to with Luminous Broodmoth. So if you have a creature that dies, it comes back with a flying counter on it. And if you have one of these enchantments out, it actually still has flying on the creature because it comes in at a later time with a new timestamp, basically. It, it, it appears later on in the layering of it. However, if the creature like Luminous Broodmoth has flying on it innately, it's going to lose that text on it. But the flying counter is what's different here. So the so. first time Luminous Broodmoth dies, if Mystic... Uh, decree was out it would come back get a flying counter and yes. now it would actually have and flying. then it would have flying again yeah interesting yeah same goes for gravity sphere and anything else that is an enchantment that removes it all at the, all at the same time however you can do this which is yeah cool. so archetype of imagination which is four blue blue for an enchantment creature um it says creatures you control have flying and creatures your opponents control uh, lose flying and can't have or gain flying gain flying ah. right so you'd have to give your archetype of imagination to your opponent <laughs> or, you know, trick them into playing one. Maybe like a Zer deck? Yeah, Zedru. Zedru, um, yeah. Then, then if you did that, then you could now pull off the in infinite sack thing, even Luminous Broodmoth, because it says it loses flying yeah. and can't have or gain flying. So does th it's like, we don't care what counters you put on it, it can't get flying. All right, I'm down for Solemnity instead. Seems, <laughs> seems a little easier. <laughs> All right. That is very powerful, though. And I'm, like I said, with just an Undying or a Persist creature, yeah, like you don't need anything else. That's just going to do the thing, right? So what do we think so far? We have now gone through all the colors. There's still a ton of multicolored cards that we have to talk about, so we're not even close to done yet, but... How did each color fare? Yeah. It feels like green fared really well, as it usually does, because Vivian is very good, and I mm -hmm. think their Mythos is very good. Yep. White actually did pretty good. Luminous Broodmoth and the uh, Dranith stop people from casting their commanders. Magistrate. Not to mention the Mardu cards that we've talked about are all okay to the Mythos one. True. Um, blue seems like it did okay here. Nothing amazing. But again, the cards in blue are all individually stronger than the ones in red, I think. Like, I feel like a lot of the strong cards we've talked about were multicolor too, the ultimatums yeah. and things like that. So that's good. You know, no specific color gets a big bump. It's specific color pairings or yeah. triplets yeah i think green did the best though for sure yeah because they oh, also big are surprise. big surprise they're also featured heavily in the ultimatums the okay. rich get richer <laughs> all right so let's true. talk about multicolored cards and there's a, actually another cycle we're gonna start yeah with. it's an interesting cycle because the cards aren't similar and they they all sort of do their own thing in their own colorways but they are all enchantments that are all based off of the five color wedges if you can remember when we did cons they had like uh, the ascendancy cycle. Yes. So, and this is kind of 
you know, the equivalent for this set. Yeah. Yeah. But they're they don't all share. build around me enchantments, kind of. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way of putting it, actually. All right. The first up is Abzan's is Death, Death's Oasis. White, black, and a green for an enchantment. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then return a creature card with lesser converted mana cost than the creature that died from your graveyard to your hand. And you can pay one to sacrifice Death's Oasis. You gain life equal to the greatest converted mana cost amongst creatures you control. Wow. Yeah. Harkens a little to Scrap Trawler in that... Yeah. Yeah, you can just start getting value, things die, get something else back to your hand. Doesn't have to be the cards you mill when the non-token creature dies. Again, a creature with just lesser CMC to your hand, so you're regrowing it not onto the battlefield, but still, this is pretty powerful. And then just added sweetness, you can gain some life off of the one ability paying one for that sack it and it's all on the card it even does the milling for you too which, yeah so it's just like a value engine card by kind of by itself right as long as you've got, you've got creatures yeah and they're dying yeah so, so yeah just seems like a very strong card yeah There's, it's not a high bar to hit you have creatures and your creatures are gonna die well that's a lot of decks yeah if you're doing like the whole witch's oven cauldron familiar thing you're gonna be sacking tons of creatures and getting a lot of value off of it uh your your friend kethis probably likes this yeah Ca kethis. cares about legendary um things into things the in the graveyard yeah. yeah yeah even if you play a card like stone coil serpent that's an xx it just dies and so that counts also for death's oasis like or an x sorry the same with like you know i've seen a lot of people do this with you know just to get a death trigger right Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, all cool stuff. Which is which is uh, oven and cauldron familiar. That's like flashbacks Cat. to Eldraine draft, which that combo was sweet if you could put it together. It's still pretty sweet and standard. I yeah, don't know if it's true. good now with all these companions running around, but it's still pretty powerful. I don't play standard, so I can only speak to draft. Exactly. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the next one of these enchantments. It's Offspring's Revenge. Two in Mardu, two red, white, and black for an enchantment. At the beginning of combat on your turn, exile target red, white, or black creature card from your graveyard. Hmm. Create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 1-1. One, one. It gains haste until your next turn. Oh, okay. So really interesting text here in that that 1-1 one, one does not go away. It is going to come back and it's going to stay on your battlefield as a 1-1, one, one, but it also gains haste. So if you have like creatures that have like really, you know, if you exile the Kalia, for instance, you'd still get the triggers because it's a copy of that card. It just happens to be a 1-1 one, one now. It also has haste, but it doesn't come in tapped and attacking. So I like this card you put down. Yeah, Tree of Perdition, everybody. <laughs> That's just mean. You just make it a 1-1, one, one, tap it, make someone's life total 1. And it has haste. Yeah, it's a black creature you can exile with Offspring's Revenge. As, as, you know, in terms of Mardu, you know, Alesha is very similar uh, types of feels when it comes to this kind of card. Uh, Mardu, again, seems to get, be getting some good tools here, a lot of graveyard recursion. Yeah, you'd want ETB effects and stuff on this yeah. to really make it shine because it's going to come in, enter the battlefield, and then, yeah. Or activated abilities don't care the power and toughness of the thing, so that works. Honestly, if you're a creature-based deck and you are in these colors, it seems like a definite run. Like, Edgar Markov is a vampire travel deck, but you have a lot of really powerful vampires that you want back on the battlefield that have an aristocrats type effect or whatever. So, Offspring's Revenge is, again, it's expensive, five mana, but mm -hmm. it's a pretty powerful ability that keeps the creature around, more importantly. Yeah, another sort of value engine card. Yeah. Okay, next up, we have the Song of Creation. It's one in Teamer, so green, blue, and red for an enchantment. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Okay. Whenever you cast a spell, draw two cards. Okay. Whoa. Okay, I'm in. At the beginning of your end step, discard your hand. <laughs> wow. Okay, so they make you pay for it. Yeah, so this is definitely one of those, like, play it, try to win that turn, If you, I think, for the most part. Yeah. But there are ways, obviously, to get around the end step discarding thing. Reality Everwise is a great way to uh, do that. Yeah, because you discard your hand, but then you just draw, draw that more. many cards. Yeah, you can yeah. sundial this, right, and get rid of sundial's that. Sundial's great. You just don't have the end step trigger happen at all. Yeah. Uh, you can have cards like Underworld Breach, which oh, yeah. allow you to play the cards out of your graveyard, so you don't really care as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I like this input. Dream Halls. This card is insane with this. Yeah. Can you imagine with Dream Halls? Dream Halls, uh, three <laughs> blue blue for an enchantment. Rather than pay the mana cost for a spell, its controller may discard a card that shares a color with that spell. This, this is a universal effect. It gives it to everybody at the table, but because every time you cast a spell, you're drawing two cards, mm -hmm. you're drawing more cards that share colors with your other cards to cast, so this is a you know, you're going to keep going. Yeah, you're going to storm off if you do <laughs> Dream Halls with Song of Creation. Keep in mind, Dream Halls is a universal effect, so other players get it too. But if it's your turn, they have to have flash speed or instance if they're going to want to abuse it. And speaking of storm, this just feels like a storm card, right? You play this yeah. on the turn, you're going to try and storm off. And then, like, rituals are really good, right? Like, ritual spells draw you two cards. Oh my gosh. And give you all that mana. mana. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's probably going to be its main usage. And we've seen, like, with Calamax and some other things, Teamer kind of 
moving into that storm possible category you know there's more tools they're anyway. not moving in they have built a yeah. house there they are ready they he is off. called the storm sire yeah they paid off their their nook bells i think kaidel a kaidel deck oh, maybe yeah. wants this because kaidel taps for the amount for colorless mana equal to the amount of uh, cards, cards you've drawn gone, this turn yeah. so and that's what you when you're drawing so many cards what you're gonna what's gonna like stop you up is the amount of mana you have how much stuff can you do before you got to get to the end step and discard mm -hmm. so just having like if you ever make infinite mana have song of creation you just kind of win right because you're gonna go through your whole deck Yo, yeah you hit the obviously deck. you can just get unlucky and draw like six lands in a row that might stop you too but i'm sure at that point you'll have something else to do with it okay this next card is pretty ridiculous yeah Titan's Nest, one black, green, and blue. Sultai again, getting the hard hitters. Enchantment, at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard. That's basically Surveil 1. Yep. And then, exile a card from your graveyard, add a colorless mana. Spend this mana only to cast a colored spell without X in its mana cost. Well, you can't cast Eldrazi with it, so it's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah, but you, you can't... You turn everything as Delve? Everything as Delve. So this card reads, basically, upkeep Surveil 1, and then colored spells without X in their mana cost have Delve. Delve was one of the most broken mechanics that was introduced, and Treasure Cruise, Dig Through Time, immediately gets banned in the Eternal formats. Titan's Nest just says, hey, I don't care. I mean, every... Yeah, just any way you're creating mana that's, like cards in your graveyard somehow like even just like if you could discard cards from your hand and make mana that way like anything you can do that's creating mana that's not the normal yeah. like tapping lands to do it is going to be busted and this is super busted i mean imagine if you hermit druid and you just have 70 cards in there you can cast your whole hand very easily if you ever have a turn where you can spend you know 25 plus mana you probably can win and yeah. obviously yeah okay you can't cast x spells so no torment of hailfire or whatever and you can't do it for colored mana but still yeah. that's still a bunch of free mana this seems like really, really powerful. You're just creating mana out of a resource that is a, is pretty easy to fill up, right? Yeah, I think it's really powerful. And my goodness, this thing will go off. I really like what you wrote here for, for this combo here. Yes, so like from under the floorboards is a card that's three black black and you create three two two tapped zombie creature tokens and gain three life. But if you madness a spell like this, it's black black and X... And if you discard this card, you can pay its uh, madness cost. And in that case, you could use the mana for X because that's a madness cost. Yeah, it's not the actual mana cost on the top right of the card. Yeah, so you, you could look for creative ways to still be able to kind of cast X spells too. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. So like, uh, yeah, this one is just like, he's like, you could totally break it. It's already broken. Like, just creating mana from, like, this random other resource. It's just, uh... Yeah, why the heck not? Okay. It seems, yeah, it seems very good. Last one is the Jeskai one. Uh, this one, actually, you know what? It, it does the thing. It's one, a blue, red, and a white for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, draw a card. Just straight draw for casting non-creature spells. It is not Jeskai Ascendancy. I think Ascendancy is still oodles better, because it can well, pump your team. Well, it's more combo-y. Yeah, it can pump your team up. It can untap mana dorks, do all sorts of interesting things. Whirlwind of Thought, though, just seems like if you are a Jeskai deck and you can spare the slot and you want more creature spell or want more guard draw spells, then you got it. I think you need a deck that has like 40 plus non-creature spells, maybe 35. Yeah. To really make again, it worth it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, storm decks, ritual decks, all that. Storm decks, it's so good. Again, yeah, you cast a ritual, draw a card. If you just tack draw a card onto all your rituals, well, you're If gonna... you stormed up for like three and then copied the spell three times, casting it three times, boom, you get four or oh, five yeah. cards off it, whatever. Yeah, you're going to win. Good. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's the... Uh, what are we calling this? The wedge cycle? Wedge yeah. enchantment build around we cycle? Yeah, enchantment wedges. In yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, uh, the we're in hour two here, so the we're not as clever as we were at the start. For Ikoria. Ikoria ascendancy. Ikoria ascendancy. There it is. These are the Ikoria ascendancies. <laughs> there it is. We found it. You there, like, it there it is. is. There it is. Ascendancies. Okay. Ascendancies, yeah. All right, whatever. All right, let's move on to the normal uh, multicolored cards, or the normal? The rest of the multicolored cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one is Cunning Night Bonder. It's, it's two hybrid Demir, so you can either play black, black, blue, blue, or blue, black. For a 2-2 human rogue with flash, spells with flash you cast cost one less to cast and can't be countered. Ooh. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, two mana for a mana reduction. Spells yep. with flash. So you're going to want to find ways to give your spells flash uh, or just play a bunch of flash cards. Yeah, it's actually hard to give your spells flash. There, mm -hmm. This guy does it. Yeah, Teferi, uh, Mage of Zalfir. Uh, two blue, 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 three blue. Creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield have flash. 
So that's going to give them flash, make it cheaper to cast, can't be countered. All of a sudden, blue having can't be countered, like creature spells, seems like a green thing. Brutal. But hey, you know, Prowling Serpapod, I'm, I'm still struggling. So the cards that say um, cast your spells as though they had flash, like yeah. Padalkanori, Raft Capuchin, Leyline, they don't work because they don't actually give the card flash. Has to have flash. Yeah, exactly. So that is a, a little bit tough. A lot of people were like, don't you like this, Josh? And I was like, I do like it, but not for why you think <laughs> yeah doesn't work with orrery but still if you have a lot of flash in your deck flash tribal man i'm in sign me up flash tribal let's do yeah. this what command would you play probably riku-esque type teamer you need like? demir now because you need demir is, that's right oh, geez. Cunning night all right five color flash tribal there you go there you go now you're speaking easy. my language jimmy easy <laughs> I, see i can build decks like josh <laughs> all right dire tactics next up white and black again getting a premium removal spell yep. white black instant uncommon exile target creature if you don't control a human then you lose life equals that creature's toughness so instead of usually you know it's the opponent gaining life or getting a land in this case you're losing life equal to the toughness only sometimes too i mean only if, sometimes yeah yeah you're definitely running this if you have a human as your commander but if you know you just have five or six don't. yeah five or six humans in the deck i think is probably fine even zero it would be at least i'd think about it i mean obviously you're gonna run path and swords mm -hmm. so but it's one it's two mana total pretty efficient yep. and it's an exile and it doesn't care. It's not like exile target human, right? It's just exile target creature. So good job. Good job, White and Black. You did the thing again. Good job. Yeah. Do they really need it? I don't know, yeah, but it is nice. good. All right. The next one is Fiend Artisan. It's two hybrid Golgari. So green, green, black, black, or green, black for a 1-1 one, one nightmare. It gets plus one, plus one for each creature card in your graveyard. And then you can pay X and a hybrid Golgari and then tap the Fiend Artisan. And then you sacrifice another creature. So that's all the cost. X, either a green or a black, tap Fiend Artisan, sacrifice another creature. And then you search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost X or less, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library, activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. So it's like Birthing Pod. However, it doesn't care about the CMC of the creature you sacked. It cares yep. about the amount of mana that you tapped. But Birthing Pod, Prime Speaker, Vanifar, similarities for sure yisan similarities tutor card creature card onto the battlefield we already know like it's good we already know this is like broken and if you want to combo with it it's not that hard because there's been so many versions of this and all of them do that also it comes out again very early so that means it's yeah. something that you can play and if you have haste you can probably activate that same turn it doesn't mean you have to put a big cost into x either right you can do it for one or two and still find a really good card a lot of the best combos we know about Include Thassa's Oracle. That's a two mana card, right? Like yeah. th a lot of big combos that win you the game aren't nine CMC worth of stuff, and this takes advantage of that because you can sack a Birds of Paradise to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can also sack creatures you steal from it as well. You know, there's lots of things you can do here. So and if again you're black and green, maybe your token deck. You have tons of creatures. It doesn't say non-token creatures, so pretty powerful. You can combine it with training grounds and things to oh, make gosh. the cost a little bit less. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, listen. Everybody out there who's listened to our show for very long can think they, off the top of their head of a bunch of ways that's they broken. They know. They know. All right. We've harked on Menace enough. Let's go for the the greatest Menace tribal. Menace card ever to exist. It's <laughs> Labyrinth Raptor, black and a red for a creature nightmare dinosaur 2-2 two -two with Menachin, no? That's Menace for everybody yeah. out there that doesn't know. Yeah. Sorry if you are upset by it. I think one person was like, I hate it when they do that. And I was like. When we call it Menace. Yeah. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> People hate weird things. Okay, go ahead. Well, notably, it was another person agreed with them in the comments, so it did take two people to correct to be able to block. Two, yeah. to <laughs> block. All right. The well, yeah. I apologize. Sorry that you're, you that you hate that. It's got Menace. Whenever a creature you control with Menace becomes block clay, blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Defending player sacrifices a creature, blocking it. And you can play a black and a red to give creatures you control with menace. Menace, shoot! Plus one, plus one until end of turn. I almost, it was almost a flawless victory. Okay, you gotta read it again. Okay, I okay. told you I was too blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a creature you control with menace becomes blocked, defending player sacrifices a creature blocking it. Black and a red, creatures you control with menace. Get plus one, plus one until end of turn. Okay, so it's men it really is menace tribal. And Why isn't this legendary? That would have been cool to have a a menace tribal deck nightmare possible. dinosaur two mana command i mean that's pretty sweet well could, yeah they could have made it a three mana commander or something yeah black and red menace is a uh, uh, an ability that's very heavy in these colors um it's really cool you you just never can block those creatures because you have to sack a creature that's blocking you really don't want to i mean you can because you get to block it and yeah if, so if you got a five five and a three three you sack the three three the five five will eat it although yeah. you can pump it but pretty cool i just like the idea of like being able to have menace do some work there was that other card in c20 that gave like 
uh, opponent that gave creatures menace if they're attacking a certain yeah, opponent or yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. Your creatures included too, so. Yeah, if they're attacking one of your opponents. Opponents, yeah. So like those together, yeah, menace, 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 tribal. Yeah, Angrath, Captain of Chaos. Maybe this is just the Brawl deck, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. uh, Angrath just says creatures you control have menace. They're, they started doing Trample tribal a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So maybe in a few years, maybe we'll get enough pieces and those decks will be real things. Well, menace isn't evergreen keyword, so yeah. that is something that exists. Okay, moving on. Proud Wild Bonder. This is two and then two hybrid gruel. Two green green, two red red, and or two red green. Four mana total for a four three human warrior has trample. Speaking of trample tribal, creatures you control with trample hey. have. You may have this creature assign its combat damage as though it weren't blocked. So it's gonna still take damage if you're blo- if it's getting blocked. Let's say seven seven gets blocked by five five, it'll still get five damage assigned to it. But you can say, I'm not gonna kill that creature. I'm gonna point all of it at you. Like Thorn Elemental, basically. Yeah, it turns all your trample creatures into Thorn Elemental, which means your trample creatures are like threatening lethal pretty fast right if you have yeah. like four trample creatures somebody could be like okay i can block i'm gonna take a little bit but i have enough toughness and you're like no actually <laughs> those blocks don't matter yeah uh soul bright flamekin is a card that can grant creatures trample and if you activate it enough you get more mana out of it so mm-hmm. lots of different ways definitely to grant trample we also had that uh that red enchantment we talked about earlier that can do it as well so yeah ronus the immortal does oh, that's give right, trample Ronis. we're actually going to talk about it for the next card but gives trample uh surak dragon claw also Gives tramples to your other creatures. Again, we're going to talk about it for the next card. So, Trample Tribal. Trample Tribal thing. is a real thing. All right, Quartzwood Crasher is the next card. Trample. Tramp. Tra- <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Those Menace people are like steams coming out of their yeah. ears. <laughs> They're like, no, every keyword. Trample. All right, Quartz. Or Streaky. Quartz- <laughs> or stri- Streaky. <laughs> Quartzwood Crasher is two red, red, green for a 6-6. Six, six. So that's five mana 6-6 six, six right there. Dinosaur Beast with Trample. Whenever one or more creatures you control with Trample deal combat damage to a player, create an XX green Dinosaur Beast creature token with Trample, where X is the amount of damage those creatures dealt to that player. So whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage, let's say you Trample over with a 5-5 five, five and you deal three damage, Boom, you get a 3-3 green dinosaur beast creature token with trample as well. So it's going to keep doing this trample, uh, the trample thing. And if you have multiple creatures that have trample, then it'll all add up together to make one big creature. Yeah, whenever one or more <clears throat> creatures. So so if you had like, yeah, five creature. Okay, that's probably magical Christmas. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> well, Sarak, yeah. you never know. Yeah, okay, true. Let's say you had two creatures though, and, and they would, you know, one gets through for three, one gets through for four. You get a 7-7 seven, seven trampler just for free? Trample, tr- trample tribal. Trample Tribal. Here we come. Yeah, also very good in Gashoth because it's a dinosaur. Lots of new dinosaurs, by the way. I'm very happy that Lair Behemoth has dinosaurs in the world. Yeah, definitely. All right, uh, the last one is called Skull Prophet. This is no keyword tribal on this one. <laughs> it's black and green for a 3-1 human druid. You can tap it to add either black or green. So it's a two-mana mana dork. But you can also tap it and put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Oh, ah, okay. All right, so it's going to it's gonna be a two-mana mana dork that taps for two colors and also mills you pretty aggressively here. This is pretty good because it's like perpetual time piece on... A creature. A, a mana, mana dork. dork. yeah. So you can actually use it for mana instead of milling yourself. Yeah, because... Early on, you maybe want the mana, and later on, you start milling yourself, or you want to get the mill plan going early, you can do that, but... Early on, you might even want the mill with, like, an yeah. eerie ultimatum, and just get that going as much as possible. You might want to get a dredge, find a dredge card somehow, yeah. Yeah, get yeah, it yeah, going, yeah. so I like that quite a bit. Okay, all right, this next card is the only artifact we're going to be talking about, and it's quite the doozy. Pretty cool. It's the Uzi Ozolith, one mana legendary artifact. Whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters on the Ozolith. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if the Ozolith has counters on it, you may move all counters from the Ozolith onto target creature. Okay, before we talk about this card, something very, very specific. The first line of text, whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters on the Ozolith. This does not mean you're taking the counters from the creature and putting it on the Ozolith. Right, because they put the word those. Yeah, those, which is very confusing, but it means... You make basically copies of those counters yep. and place them on the Ozolith. So they're new counters. They're new counters. So if you had the two minus one minus one counters on a creature, it dies, you get to place two minus one minus one counters on the Ozolith, not the ones from the creature. So those counters still fizzle or whatever happens to them when they reach a new zone. Yeah. This thing's one mana. Yeah. That seems nuts. That seems really nuts. I mean, it's not four or five mana? Like I would have... I could imagine just, three, right? Like if they just showed me the card and covered the mana cost and said, what do you think? I would have said four. Like I might even Panharmonicon like, or something, yeah, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah, it's four in or that, five. Yeah, it feels like it's in that world of Panharmonicon. Like 
it's the Panharmonicon four counters decks. Mm-hmm. One mm-hmm. mana though, this yeah. that makes it like super good. It's really powerful. Um, it's really really good in Toothy Imaginary Fiend. Oh yeah. Uh, this is like again. Oh, here's the thing. One at the beginning of combat in return, if the Ozolith does have counters on, then those counters actually do get moved onto target creatures. So those counters stay on the battlefield. It's not like new ones. Not like Ozolith keeps them forever. Yeah, it's really strange. Um, in terms of the, it gets brand new counters, but those are the ones that gets moved off. Yeah, Toothy, Toothy draws you cards for plus one plus one counters. And when it leaves the battlefield, you draw a card for each plus one plus one counter on it because again it leaves with those counters and then Ozola sees it leaving but it doesn't take the counters away from Toothy so it works really well there really good to Marchesa because every time you have a dethrone trigger you can't keep dethroning people if you're attacking them you're going to get that plus one plus one counter on the Ozolith this creature's going to come back and you can put it onto something else it's pretty sweet uh, Voral of the whole clade of course cares yep. about counters doubles them uh, and it can do it on the artifact mm-hmm. so uh, that's going to get nuts you're going to like control. this one a lot yeah. yeah Hapatra is actually really interesting because the Ozilus second text reads, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if the Ozilus has counters on it, you may move all those counters from the Ozilus onto target creature. Ah. Doesn't have to be creature you control. In Hapatra, you're often getting negative one counters on your own stuff because you mm-hmm. have things that just put negative one counters on everything, and some of your stuff dies, but you don't care because you're making snakes. But because that stuff dies with negative one counters on it, goes on the Ozilus, and now you're like, oh, on combat on my turn, I'm going to move all those to your creature, dies, yeah. and I get snakes. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> because I put it on your creature, they don't go back on the Ozolith because the Ozolith only gets counters from your creatures yep. but can give counters to any creature. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so persist counters, again, you can move off, and now all of a sudden... Now, they're still going to go to the bathroom, the bathroom, to the graveyard with a minus one, minus one counter on it. To the bathroom. That's what we call the graveyard. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to get flushed away. They just get flushed away. Maybe that's just exile then. <laughs> they're in the, the toilet, and then when they get flushed away, they get exiled. Okay. Uh, so, like, Vorath the Shape Stealers is really cool with this, too. Um, now, the, again, because of the way it works, it's really good with hardened scales and modular cards. Oh, hardened scale says if one or more plus one plus one counters we put on the creature you control that many plus one plus one plus one counter put on it instead so a creature leaves the battlefield also is going to get that counter and then when the counter gets moved onto a creature you get plus one you get plus one yeah, yeah. winding constrictor still going to work yeah uh modular again you get double up uh, basically a modular as well it's with winding constrictor you get it twice right when the thing dies you'd go to put the counters on the yeah, ozolith, it's an artifact and you'd get Holy another one moly. and then when you moved it off ozolith you'd get another one yeah yeah that's pretty sweet that's an engine that so, is an engine. Skullbri- I want to say, we, we have to, we have to oh, mention yeah, Skullbriar. Yeah, yeah. Skullbriar, right? I accidentally said you could put it in your hand and keeps the counters. I was wrong. <laughs> so just ignore that part of the last podcast. Uh, yeah, we, well, when we speak for two hours straight, we are bound to make some mistakes. Uh, yeah. New, yeah. new Volrath. Pretty cool. Yep. Okay, okay, Ozolith. I like it. It's, it's nuts. It's really sweet. I think it goes in the... Yeah, it definitely goes in, the, in the, pre- the primo pile. pile. Yeah. yeah. We're, as you can see, if you're watching the video, we're slowly making a pile of what are going to be the nominees for the best and our favorite cards at the end and so there's a lot actually yeah okay the last card we're going to talk about is a land from the set it's called bonders enclave it's uh you can just tap it for a colorless mana does not come into play tapped but it also has an activated ability you pay three tap it and draw a card you can activate this ability only if you control a creature with power four or greater couldn't have just kept it just at three maybe sorcery speed only or something i don't know I think it would have been maybe better if it said only if you've attacked with a creature this turn. Oh, okay. That's cool. Because it could help white Mm -hmm. um, and red who are often like, listen, they design all the commanders telling you you have to attack with stuff. So let's reward that. But this rewards a weird thing that which is large creatures. Yeah. Which to me reads more as like help green draw cards. They don't need it. Red, maybe. There's a lot of four power creatures in red. But again, this is, it's not super efficient. It's not great. But if you, again. Yeah, it's three mana. Like it could be two mana tap it and only activate if you attacked with a creature this turn. I think that would be fine because it's actually costing you three mana. See, you read this as it costs you three mana, but it actually actually costs you four mana because you have to tap the Bonders Enclave yeah. plus three other mana. So four mana draw cards is just not something you're going to want to do. Now like, we're looking at it from the ever. lens of Commander. I'm yeah. sure in Standard there's a lot of token makers running around. This is maybe a little too powerful, maybe for control decks even, you know, but in this Man, case... Four yeah. mana draw a card, like it just feels like that's existed before. Yeah. Oh, well, it definitely has. It's like Arch of Araska. Yeah. Okay. Which did see play in Standard and stuff, I guess. Yep. 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 Okay, Alrighty. let's, okay, so we've been pulling aside the nominees for, there's two categories, we're going to do most powerful new card, and then our favorite new card, which often we don't think, uh, our favorite's not the most powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a tough one. This is really tough, because I think you can define most powerful in a couple of different ways. Yeah. 
And I can honestly, there's two cards I think win for most powerful for me. I'm going to narrow it down a little bit here. I think, I think, yeah. uh, boy. I think this is just has to be the most powerful because this says win the game on it. If we're going to go by that metric, right? Yeah. You also have to consider like casting costs and how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. I think my three nominees narrowed down here. Let me, let me read the cards that we pulled out initially. Sure. So these are the ones in the running. So from the ultimatum cycle, we have Eerie Ultimatum, the Abzan one that gets all your permanents out, and Emergent Ultimatum, which tutors cards and puts them into your... No, you pick three cards. Oh, sorry, cards. you pick three cards and your opponent chooses one that you don't keep. Yeah, and you cast the other two. Titan's Nest, the one that gives all your spells delve, basically. Mm -hmm. Luminous Broodmoth, the Mothra that has Unflying. The Ozolith, the one we just talked, talked about. about. Fiend Artisan, which is the Birthing Pod variant. Vivian, uh, who... Gets you an extra creature. You tutor out of your deck whenever you cast a creature. That's her negative two. That makes her very powerful. Mythos of Brokos, which is get two permanent cards out of your graveyard, but if you cast it with um, Demir, basically Mana. if you cast it for Sultai, then it, you also tutor a card into your graveyard. Mm -hmm. And then Call of the Death Dweller, which is getting back two creatures from your graveyard with a total converted mana cost of three or less. Up to two. You don't have to get two. So uh, big themes here, graveyard and tutoring. Yep. Okay, so we narrowed it down. We eliminated some of the possibilities, and we think the three in the running... Boy, these two are close, I think, too. But the three I'd put in the running are Emergent Ultimatum. Again, that's the card where you you cast it. You find three cards in your um, library, then target mm -hmm. opponent chooses one of them. You cast the other two for free. Titan's Nest. All your cards have Delve, basically, not Expels. Um, and then Luminous Broodmoth, which is the unflying card. Cool to see a mono white card in here. That's nice. There's a yeah. lot of value stacked onto that. I wish it was legendary. You know, I honestly think it's very close between these two. And they're both Sultai. So Emergent Ultimatum and Titan's Nest. Yeah. And Titan Nest, Titan's Nest might get the edge over Emergent Ultimatum because I could see more people just playing Titan's Nest and not trying to get a win condition with Emergent Ultimatum. Yeah. Titan's Nest is, listen, you're just creating mana from thin air, kind of. Yeah you just know that's busted broken and and you're gonna be able to do some crazy stuff it also feels itself yeah and it can be really innocuous it's you just a good card to play right because it's yeah. going to <laughs> it's just going to like mill you and get you stuff back even if you don't really abuse the second part of it there's so many times when you're going to play this and no one's going to counter it how many times are you going to play an ultimatum and people are going to go i'm waiting to counter that yeah exactly it's seven mana that does mean that the ultimate is potentially more powerful but well i think you have to factor that in right like, like the, the mana cost how much yeah. it costs does count like a, a two mana spell that's very 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 powerful but can only get so high it's two mana yeah and is never going to compare to expropriate but that doesn't mean expropriate is always the most powerful right. because something is very efficient at four mana yeah i think fiend artisan and the new vivian also could be in the conversation fiend artisan is i mean birthing pod variants are just very powerful yeah i mean you made them too because it could just win you the game on the spot right it has that same ability I'm going to say Titan's Nest, I think. I, I was going to say Titan's Nest from the beginning. Giving it's, it's everything very, Delve. Come on. Yeah, but it's very close. I agree with you. There's a lot of very powerful stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, but and it's all look, in green and black. It's all in green, black, and then white actually makes a surprise appearance. Yeah. Through Luminous Broodmoth and Eerie Ultimatum. Yeah, so. red's not here at all. And neither is. And blue's just uh, yeah, pieces blue's of Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely black and green are the big winners of this set. And the two most played colors we know in Commander and the winningest, or sorry, the two winningest colors winningest, we did our yeah. stat stuff, yeah. All right, favorite overall card. I'm going to go for the Ozolith. That's what I was going to say, too, because so it has cool. the most cool <laughs> interactions. It's also so innocuous. And yeah. I, I like cards that people go like, holy crap, that Ozolith has just been going off all game. And you're like, oh, whoops. It's only one mana. That's the thing that just blows my mind about it. Yeah. yeah. You, there's going to be fun, crazy stuff that happens with Ozolith. And I... Listen, there's probably combo -y stuff you can do, but I think it's not going to be like somebody plays the Oz Ozolith and you're like, okay, if we don't kill that, we die next turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it's not a card that, you know, can win you the game on the spot like Emergent Ultimatum can either. That's interesting. We agreed on both cards. Doesn't always happen. Yeah, well, maybe they're just, they're clear winners, <clears throat> you know? Okay, before <laughs> we go to, to the listeners, I wanted to ask, a, put a question out here, which Ooh. is, this I, is, we're at the tail end of our our coverage. We're obviously still going to talk about these cards from both C20 and Ikoria Layer of Behemoths mm -hmm. for a little while to come, but this is our main coverage. We've broken down the decks. We've really delved into all the cards. Uh, we're probably going to be building some specific decks and talking about that or whatever, or go back to like more evergreen uh, topics. We have game nights coming out as well very soon for the C20 Commander Precons. Right. So... This is an experiment. They've never done this before. They released two sets at the same time, mm -hmm. a Commander product and a main set. 
We looked at all the cards. We've graded everything. How do you think that experiment turned out? How do you think it, it went? From a content creator standpoint, it was kind of hell. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, normally August uh, is our crazy month when they do the pre-cons, and that's the month that I can distinctly remember every year, back when we were at the Rocket Jump offices, and even before that, just running around with our heads like on fire, pretty much, just trying to get through all the content. And this month was quite the challenge on top of the whole pandemic that's running around the world that caused us to go remote. At the same time, there are a lot of really cool cards now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they did a really good job adding just stuff all across the board, except, of course, you know, white and red get a little bit of help, but not nothing's perfect. But we have the rest of the year to sort of scope that out, I think. I don't love the fact that so much stuff came out at the same time because my fear is that I'm just going to forget a lot of things that happened, even though we spent two hours talking about every single part of the set. Yeah, I feel like I got it got numb at a certain point i'm I mean, definitely numb now <laughs> the content creator stuff i totally agree with you the, it was brutal that that part of it whatever though the, i don't want them to make decisions based on the content yeah, yeah, creators, no, obviously um i would rather that they spread stuff out so we could have more time to like sleep and stuff but th whatever that's that's neither here nor there but as just a person consuming the previews and the excitement of the whole thing like you can only be at like maximum hype for so long yeah. and then doesn't matter what happens it just starts to to be numbing and I felt this numbing quality so that it's it's weird when we started doing the set review for Aquaria Lair of Behemoths I felt like I was being forced to look at these cards and it was almost hard because my mm. brain wanted to just slide off it it just wanted to be like oh more Astral cards. slide off yeah please yeah. okay we get it yeah another cycling thing yeah, yeah yeah so I can only imagine for a person out there who doesn't have to force themselves to go through this process like we do because we're making content about it that you know I can again I can only guess but it feels like people would be maybe less inclined to be excited about a lot of stuff just because too much stuff got thrown at them in too short a period of time. I mean... Yeah. I mean, even when I made the outlines and stuff, I was like doing the C21. I was like, crap, half these cards are in the set. There was so much overlap. Like if you ask the average commander player, do you think they'd be able to really have a good grasp on what came out in this set and Ikori at the same time? Like there's a lot going on. So it, I think separating them by a month or even would have been a, a big help. Yeah, I wouldn't have minded if the C20 products came out later, but still had the tie into the mechanics because that set is still in standard. People are still excited about the mechanics and now they've seen them in action. Maybe they give them more brewing possibilities too. Yeah, now you're like, you know that mutate mechanic that you've had fun with, you know, at the pre-release yeah. and stuff? Now you can build a commander deck about, around it. I don't think bringing them out the exact same moment was probably ideal. So yeah, I'd be interested really to hear what everybody else out there thinks about that topic. And obviously to the listeners, we're going to ask you, you know, what's your favorite card from Ikoria? What do you think is the most powerful card? Do you think we're correct about Titan's Nest and the Ozolith? Or do you think it's something else? Um, do you think we were way off? Is there a card that you think is just awesome or really yeah, powerful that we like didn't even pull out? Some random common we missed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we always like to hear that stuff, but I'd also like to hear how, what people thought about the whole du dual release of two sets thing. And I think, unfortunately, this pandemic is going to muddy those waters, too. Yeah, it's going to make it a lot harder to truly evaluate it. Yeah, even for Wizards to to really know, like, what caused what and why, because too many things got changed, and you can always attribute it to different, you know, yeah, yeah. you can misattribute, like, what happened there. So, anyway, I would like to hear from people out there. Um, Let us know. Either way, you are right. A lot of cool cards, tons of stuff that we're going to be putting in a bunch of different decks. If you want to get a hold of any of this stuff, please head on over to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. They are absolutely the best place to get your cards. They're going to get them to you super, super fast. They're going to be in great condition. If there's any troubles, it's just the troubles happen sometimes, Card Kingdom. They iron out that stuff. They make the customer feel right. We hear stories yeah. all the time of like, hey, they messed up my order and they just went above, above and beyond, and beyond. Yeah, every to time. make it right. And that's really what we want and why we feel so comfortable just plugging Card Kingdom every single episode because we know that we can stand behind them and say like, they're going to get your your stuff the fastest. It's going to be the best. Yeah, I've ordered stuff off other websites before. It comes mispackaged. It comes mishandled. Like some kid in the basement in Illinois sent it and, and all of a sudden it's scuffed up. And You I have can't... no customer service department to even contact. Yeah, and that kid's not refunding you either because that was his lunch money. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> our other sponsor for the show is Ultra Pro because if you want to protect those cards and not let them get scuffed up in the mail you know hey put them into a sleeve put them into a eclipse sleeve put them on the ultra pro play mat 
And cleanliness is really important these days. And I think that's actually something that's really does, uh, you know, you go to Magic Fest, you are in contact with a lot of people all the time. So being able to have a handle on what is yours and what you know is safe and out, you know, germ free is also really important. And Ultra Pro gives you that option. If you're just playing on the table and stuff, it can be fun. You can be like Josh shuffling an unsleeved deck, but at a certain point, you're going to want to protect those cards. Okay, what? I don't do that. Oh, yeah. Unlimited. Well, limited, 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 yeah, yeah, limited. Yeah, yeah. I don't do the commander decks. You know, something cool that Ultra Pro just posted on Twitter. Did you see this? No. They have like a satin tower decks box, but it has like a speaker in the top. Oh, it's like a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. Now, <laughs> listen, I don't, I don't need the speaker part, but it has a USB outlet, and I think you can charge your phone. Dude, that's... now that I want so bad because I always have my like brick battery charger <laughs> on top of the deck box and everything else. Yeah. yeah. So like having a charger in the deck box is that's like, pretty cool. Listen, Life Linker, we all know like it'll take your battery down a little bit. That's just the way it goes with it. if you're just running an app on your phone, whatever for a long it is. Time, yeah. For a long time, it's high just brightness. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. So one of the you know I. I Look for that product. We're probably going to put up a little screenshot. I don't know when it's going to be available. I know they tweeted about it, but yeah, that's something pretty cool they've got All coming right. out of the pipe. Thanks, Ultra Pro. Always innovating. Appreciate it. All right. Now it is time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. And we're going to do the end step this time because a friend of mine has a book. I've got a book. I'm your friend. <laughs> It's me. I released a co on top of everything else that's been happening in the world. I had a haven't been busy enough. Yeah, haven't been busy enough. People uh, don't know that you started working on this like you know more than a year ago. Yeah, two years actually two and a half years ago because you have to pitch the publisher and all that stuff. But I came out with a cookbook. It's called The Feast of Fiction Kitchen. I'll give you the quick breakdown because I've done it now so many times. Fifty five full page recipes from all of your favorite you know franchises and stuff. We have full page photographs, recipes from Star Wars, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, all sorts of cool stuff. But uh, the book's available now. You can get it digitally or off Amazon or Barnes and Noble or a lot of bookstores these days are doing a local pickup. You can just give them a ring and then you can jump in there on curbside. They'll deliver the book to you. And that's a great way to support the bookstore too. And once the world's back to normal, which hopefully is soon, it's going to be in like big box retailers like Walmart yeah, and stuff, right? Walmart, Target. And like, look, if you like these franchises, if you ever want to make butter beer from Harry Potter or, you know, uh, scones from X thing or whatever, tarts from Avatar Last Airbender, the Imagination Pie from Hook, all of it's in here. Check it out. Been doing this for nine years now on my other YouTube channel. So we finally made a book out of it. It's pretty cool. You I have can, a book. I'm getting ready, getting ready to take a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. I was saying that this is good timing though, because a lot of people have been forced to be at home. I mean, I know I'm in this situation. Yeah. We're like, listen, I never cooked before, but I kind of had to recently and I, I like yeah i kind of enjoyed it and i'm like not that bad at it so yeah. i'm like this is perfect time i'm gonna pick up the book i can actually i've been cooking Look a little so i don't stuff. feel like yeah. total fish out of water yeah 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 so doing you, some hawaii recipes yeah some spam masubis sure <laughs> josh is like yeah rice and meat actually actually it's harder than you think because it doesn't want to hold together very well if you don't oh, do it spam. right and yeah, you need yeah, the yeah. sauce and everything spam musubi is a real art so uh that's good that's true spam is delicious if yeah spam well, is right. delicious <laughs> feast of fiction kitchen you yeah, can find it online the best place is probably like amazon or something yeah, amazon yeah they're also giving discounts obviously you know and digitally too if you just want to have it on your kindle or ipad that's a great way to do it apple books and all that stuff has it too and listen like the early first couple of weeks are really good are really big for like books and publishing and what will happen is if it does well in that time frame then the publishing company will push a lot more money behind it and also sites like amazon will actually recommend it more we'll recommend it yeah, yeah so it anybody that can help it. out that if you are interested grab it soon because that will help jimmy and the sales and the book itself like do better yeah also it's a book it's a great gift too for any enthusiast gamer nerd all that stuff just the pictures and stuff on it like it's a great book just even to sit on like your coffee table because yeah it's I mean, the kind you of thing that up, people are like, like oh yeah wow. i saw that show but you made it for real yeah it looks so nice all these pictures we spent so much time on it thank you yeah i remember when you guys were shooting the pictures yeah we it took a while it took a while my entire apartment exploded basically <laughs> to make it happen <laughs> it turned out great man congratulations Thanks, man. thank you thank you all right our editing uh, graphics and logistics team is craig munchett ashlyn rose lady danger manson lung alfred estaca josh murphy jake boss and sam waldo they have all been working so so hard for all this content big ups we're going to be going back to normal after this one one podcast episode per week but we do have game nights coming up uh at least the next game nights may 13th is going to be the release of that episode it will feature the c20 uh commander pre-con stuff and, and then yes too yeah and then after that well we'll see what happens with game nights we're gonna try and record another one as soon as we're able but yeah, with get the back running as much as we can but yeah, thank you all for understanding as well especially our kickstarter donors uh we're finally getting some stuff out the window at the door so 
We're very grateful for things to slowly start safely returning to normal. Yeah, I hope that will happen soon, but it should only happen when, uh, you know, the world's ready for it. Yep. And big ups as always to Jeffrey Palmer for the 11 card animations that live behind us here on set and lead and end our videos at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. Find Jeffrey online at living cards MTG. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching everything uh, we've been doing over the last thank you. month and a half. And uh, <laughs> thank you too, Josh, for making it through. We did it. We did it. Now let's go both take a nap. Yeah, I can't wait. Separately, six feet yeah. apart. <laughs> six feet apart. All right, bye, guys. All right, peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>